Um, and sooner or later, we're going to get to, and how do we run all the tools and equipment? And we're going to need power. So I knew from being out in the scene that everybody else was already on food and water and medicine and community development and networking. But there just isn't anybody working on, and how are we going to provide power? So I picked up that bit and went, right, that's, that's what I'm going to have to look at. That's going to be my, my thing. Um, so it took four or five years to get the cash together to actually do it and build enough of a network to actually do something with Guy. And eventually I managed to get in contact with Paul and raise the epic amount of money necessary to fly around the world and go and see Paul and spend the month with him and work with him on Guy, learn from him. And then I put three years of day and night every day for a full three years in on, does this thing work and how does it work and what causes it to not work? And I have taken those things apart and put them back together thousands and thousands and thousands of times. So there's all the crazy effects that you can get, but there was this like, the, the, what's the process when you build a reactor and you fit it to an engine, how do you tune this thing so that it works? Because there are so many variables, although it's an incredibly simple thing, there are so many variables and you don't have control over all of them. You kind of influence the thing. <laughs> so you have to work out which piece of my system is wrong. Is it my air management valve? Is it something to do with the reactor? Is it the way I fitted my exhaust? And every single fitting has an effect in the way the gases flow through the system. So debugging why your engine isn't working is like a, it is 5D engineering because you have to go at it from so many different directions. Now, when Paul built them, he would use a, a type of meditation, a cross between meditation and lucid dreaming, <laughs> build his reactor in 3D, fit it to an engine and simulate the thing running because he understood everything that was happening in and around it. He had a working model in his head that would allow him to do this. Then he would build something, put it on an engine, and he'd go, ah, oh, it's got this problem, that problem, and that problem. He'd change the three things in one go, and then it would work. But if you only changed one of those things, that was the right move, but you still got two other faults. So it doesn't work. And you go, ah, oh, you start questioning whether the, the change you made was right. It hasn't solved the problem. But it's because you've got three issues. So Paul didn't have a linear how do I approach this problem? It was, it, it didn't, they didn't exist in his head. So it, I spent three years going, right, and it isn't working today because, which might mean building four or five different versions of a piece of equipment somewhere in it, running simultaneous sequential tests for a week to find out whether or not that was the bit that was wrong. So I've got a whole hard drive full of, I think it's a quarter of a terabyte or half a terabyte of video log and photo of every single variant and refinement on the system trying to figure out what it does. Well, that's fantastic, Dan. It's of, a course, minefield. <laughs> of course, no one wants to go through all that learning again. No, so uh, we don't we don't have the time for that. No, like, no we, need we, we learn now. <laughs> So actually, you were talking to me earlier about how um, you met uh, uh, um, Paul, and he described how he chanced or, or how he came upon this. If you could recount that story, I think people will find that very interesting. <laughs> yes. Paul didn't set out to build a plasma reactor. Okay, He was a very gifted person, and he did communicate with higher level beings and entities. And I think it was uh, the angel Ezekiel was the one who was supposed to have brought forth the initial little bit of inspiration and nudged him down the line. But originally it was a vaporizing carburetor. You're gonna pass a fuel gas, take a liquid fuel, convert it into a vapor, put it down a tube, put exhaust gas the other way, because you would obviously put them in contra flow if you were to build a heat exchanger. And you would just heat up the gas coming off the bubbler and send it to the engine. That was the original idea. At some point, he came across the idea of sticking a rod inside there so that the fuel went through a small gap rather than just loosely going down the pipe. And obviously, that would increase the efficiency of the vaporizing carburetor. And then one day, all of a sudden, it starts doing other things. 
normally what will happen when you get a geek reactor go from vaporizing carburetor mode to geek reactor mode it suddenly wants to accelerate because now it's getting way way more fuel than you need and the first thing you know is your engine is trying to like bury the throttle at eight or nine thousand rpm because the reactor just kicked in and up until that moment it's just been a vaporizing carburetor but that's that's what it was designed to be it wasn't designed to be anything more miraculous than that and it's through paul's journey and all the guys that have been working with him it's through their journeys of building things and accidentally stumbling upon weird and wonderful th effects like the reversing field effect and if you read the book they describe some um, little tornado of water coming up off the floor uh, and being drawn towards the reactor like nobody set out to try and make that happen <laughs> right these are just weird things that have happened um <laughs> trying Can to I ask it, that example you've just given was that in a horizontal or a vertical reactor a horizontal system? reactor that was hung off yeah. the top of an engine six inches off the ground and one of the boys was playing around with it behind the shed somewhere and it was kind of raining and drizzling and the ground was wet and there was a bit of an electrical storm blowing in in the distance and paul was saying you know we shouldn't really be playing with these things in a storm like this <laughs> maybe not and the guy's oh yeah, yeah, yeah whatever and all of a sudden he comes running around the corner paul paul come and see this i've got tornadoes <laughs> <laughs> yeah horizontal reactor over a wet ground in a, in a lightning storm I mean, that's the thing about Paul. He, he was obviously a, a, a quite a larger than life character and he's a great storyteller from the videos that I've seen. His timing is perfect. His charisma flows out through what he's saying. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, if there was one story that you would recount, I mean, there's always obviously the credit card stories and, and those. He's got a classic repertoire of those that he, 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 he would uh, repeat. But if there's one that he kind of told you personally, that that was a, a real nugget. What, what would that be? Oh, there's a few. Um, remember, he used to claim he could blow up a building with a glass of water. <laughs> okay, go on. <laughs> <laughs> he, made, he woke up in the middle of the night with a crazy idea, as as you do, as and uh, went out in the yard and built something. Right. And it was um, two manhole covers two cast iron manhole covers which the foot of molding inside to strengthen them happened to create a bit of a dip like that so he sandwiched two together thinking oh, that's 30 kilos a piece they ain't going anywhere i'll just put one on top of the other cut some slots into it mounted a tube in it in a certain way it's like put some water in there with a little bit of petrol and you're going to have you know a nice big flat disc that tapers off to the edge and air is going to come out the top and it's going to be drawn in through the side and obviously spin inside and it should mix water with fuel and maybe it'll burn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great, great idea. So he lights the thing and it goes off like a freaking jet engine <laughs> and starts to roar because he's really got this laid up nicely. And at a certain point, he realizes he's overcooked this and has to leg it across the yard and dive for cover behind the building as it reaches critical speed and <laughs> detonated. Oh, God. Unfortunately, he hadn't bolted anything together all to the ground. He just figured it was big and heavy and metal and was going to stay there. So the, the hearing explosion took out all the windows on the buildings. Oh, and rather large pieces of steel ended up bedding inside the wall, <laughs> right close to his head. So when playing with crazy little ideas that you have at two o'clock in the morning, sometimes you're going to get it right. Sometimes you're going to get it right so well, it's going to end up all over the yard. So uh, I think probably um, this is, I always have this safety thing that I like to talk about. Obviously, your mix, your, this discussion is about using engines, internal combustion engines, but sometimes they're a little bit external when you're, when you're fiddling with them, as, as this kind of like indicates you might be. Uh, <laughs> and, and so please, if you don't know what you're doing uh, and you're listening to this, uh, you need to seek help. Um, it, <laughs> Even if you know what you're doing, you can still blow yourself up. My, my brother oh, yeah, blew I, himself I, up once. I've never blown up anything with heat. Right. And, and why, do you, why, up, why do you think that is? Um, well, the fuel vapors coming off the bubbler are too rich to burn. Right. You've got to let air in on the other side. So it's all, mm -hmm. It doesn't flash back. There is no flashback. So I have never managed to get a geek to explode. And believe me, if it was going to explode, it would have exploded for me. 
I have blown up HHO rigs like it's going out of fashion. I go anywhere near them and they just explode. <laughs> Everything will blow up if I play with it. Well, uh, Mr. Amaza did kill his <laughs> the reactor. Did kill someone last year, and and uh, he nearly died himself. So he has to blow one up. Did he put HHO in it? it it's basically the best HHO generator on planet Earth, and uh, unfortunately, for whatever reason, maybe the flashback su suppressor failed or whatever, and it was a major accident, and it nearly wrote okay. off, wrote it off. So was that, um, was that adding a geek system to HHO? Was it or something like that? No, just, no, just yeah. uh, he was doing. I think one of his standard demonstrations, um, but it, it, it is extremely risky. Um, it's, really, it's really high risk stuff. Yeah, I, I, so, I blew up quite a few rigs last year playing with HHO mm -hmm. uh, on those same engines, those little Honda engines. Right, right. Uh, why, why were you doing that? Uh, we'll, we'll finish the. I think we've probably got a full quorum here. I don't think I'm going to expect oh, anyone else. I, I like to play with more than just geek. <laughs> who doesn't <laughs> more, it's more to life than just geeked I did three years of OCD I, ended up sitting, I, had to, I had to go and sit on a mountain for nine months and wait for my head to like come back to reality so Dan I guess my first and, and prime question uh, before I let everyone else uh, hit, hit the table running here or the ground running is how long did you get a re geek to run for reliably oh they run continuously we'll just sit there and run right if you've built them properly, if you've engineered them, physically built them properly, then they're really, really stable. Even in vaporizing carburetor mode, you have your, you've got your intake of the engine with your air management valve, so you've got one valve there, and you've got a little carburetor feeding fuel to the reactor. Forget about whether the reactor's running and, and emissions. Mm -hmm. If you've built it nicely and properly, you set those controls and they stay there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And nothing moves. It's more stable than a standard carburetor system. Mm -hmm. You know, they're continuously having a governor going like that, twitching away on those engines. Mm -hmm. They never run. They thought like, dumpy, noisy. You put the geek system on there and it just runs. It does exactly what it's doing. You can change your air fuel mixes a bit and you'll throw a reactor in and out of balance. So you can push it from being a vaporizing carburetor into being a heat reactor and back again with the way you set it. So you, you have to keep it in balance for that. And then you let the thing go and it'll just sit there and run. So, so for, for those that don't know, what is the difference between a vaporizing carburetor and the GEET gas? What, what is, in the broadest sense, what do you believe is the principal difference in the GEET gas over just a fuel mix? Well, if you're, really it's to do with emissions. Yeah, um, if it's a vaporizing carburetor, you're breaking down long chain fuels into short chain fuels. So you're putting in petrol, which is a mix of various lengths of chain, um, with octane being a primary mm -hmm. with eight carbons. Mm -hmm. And you're cutting that down into something like methane and butane in that sort of size as a really good vaporizing carburetor. And you can run the engine on that. Mm -hmm. So you'll get a massive reduction in carbon monoxide because you've got a, a smaller fuel. Um, you'll get a huge reduction in unburnt fuel because it's a smaller clean burning fuel, it all, it all burns away, but you'll have a really high CO2 level and very little oxygen, right? So that's a vaporizing carburetor. You can lean the mix down, you can open your air management valve and you can go, oh, it's this burning cleaner and cleaner and cleaner and cleaner, and your oxygen content starts coming up, but the carbon dioxide is still sitting there. It's like everything you put in is still coming out as carbon dioxide. And now it's getting leaner and leaner and the engine gets hot because it's a lean burning engine and you get pre-ignition. <laughs> so you, you're getting detonations now instead of combustion, so you're getting pre-detonations in the engine. So you start getting knocking and pinking and then it'll overheat. So you can't have full power, you can't run it continuously because you'll, you'll literally melt the pistons out if you, if you just let it run like that. So when you start seeing an oxygen content on those engines of 12%, or 14%, you're literally burning out the valves in that moment. Right. And it won't, okay. it won't run that long. Then you get it across to being a geek reactor. And suddenly you're not running on methane and butane and propane. You're now running on this other gas. You're running on something else now. Um, and your reactors can kick in and out. They can cycle. So for a split second, it's making geek gas. And for a split second, it's sending petrol. And it'll send geek gas and then it'll send petrol. So you're getting a kind of a mix 
And then you'll start seeing oxygen contents at 14% and above. And normally one of those engines, it's, it's like oxygen content would be one or 2%. And when they're at full load, there's 0% oxygen left in the exhaust. And there's a huge chunk of carbon monoxide because it isn't burning all of its fuel. And they're a fuel cooled engine. They're an air cooled engine, but they cool themselves down by throwing fuel in there on their intake stroke, the huge chunk of fuel goes in, the piston comes around the bottom, and as it's coming up to compression, it actually opens its exhaust valve, and it pushes a load of fuel out. So the first bit of fuel that goes in on every stroke just boils off in the cylinder and is dumped out back of the engine to stop them from overheating. Because now when you're sending heat gas in there, it doesn't have any of that fuel to boil off, but it runs cooler. So if you start sending a mix of geek gas and butane propane type molecules in there, it's going around, it's being dumped out the back, then it's put under compression and it's ignited. And it's ignited really early. So as you lean that mix down, you suddenly start to get excess oxygen. When it's running on geek, the, out, the oxygen output should now be above 16%. As you just get rid of this extra little bit of fuel, the unburnt hydrocarbons drop from 250, 300 parts per million to zero, maybe 10. And 10, well, that's actually engine oil burning off inside the cylinder, as far as I can tell. You, you actually said that that can be a problem. It can. It can be an issue. Oh, it was an issue if you try to do an exhaust recirculation. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to suck the exhaust gas back out, put it into the front, and you're boiling off engine oil in the piston because it's getting too hot you start looping something through the reactor that it can't eat and then carbon builds up in it unburnt fuel starts to build up in it and eventually the airstream gets so dirty the reactor shuts down so yes you can put them on a closed loop but no you don't you don't run an engine on a closed loop that's, that's for demonstrations um, <clears throat> but yeah if you've got an oxygen content of 18 percent or above mm -hmm. no unburnt fuel no carbon dioxide, no carbon monoxide, and no NOx gases, which is your indicator for has my engine overheated, is, is it making NOx gas? Um, then how are you pouring petrol in one end and getting something out that looks like air on the other? <laughs> and occasionally, when, you, when I've done, I ran one on ginger beer, I took it to a mechanics in London and said, have you got a proper emissions tester? Yes, we do, please test my engine, get the data, 20, you know, 200 and something parts per million um, fuel, 14% uh, carbon dioxide, 6% carbon monoxide, 1% oxygen. Okay, great. Now let's put this system on it, run it on ginger beer with a splash of petrol, 19% oxygen, minus 10% carbon. <laughs> hey. <laughs> <laughs> now have we got minus 10% unburnt fuel? Right. It's in a garage, isn't it? And the machine's mm -hmm. been switched on and it sucks some air that's in the garage into the machine. It's calibrated itself to zero. I've now put it into the exhaust and uh, my air is coming out cleaner than the air is in the middle of London in a mechanics by 10 parts. So, so you're cleaning the air. So, so <laughs> yeah. can, can I ask um, what kind of level of efficiency have you personally observed? With the vaporizing carburetor mode, and what have you observed with the geek gas mode uh, in your experience? And and then could you secondly say what you've um, <clears throat> been told in terms of third party experience? Uh, in terms of vaporizing carburetor mode, you can take a quarter off the fuel consumption. I mean, that's extremely that's, significant. That's good. Yeah, yeah. 20, 20, 20, 25 percent reduction in fuel, mm -hmm. and slash your emissions right down. As mm -hmm. long as you don't expect too much of it, you can bring it down to it's starting to look more like a car than, mm -hmm. on a, than, a, than a generator engine. Mm -hmm. um, without overheating the, the engine itself, you can actually run them like that quite happily mm -hmm. and save yourself some fuel. Um, if you're not getting a 50% reduction in fuel consumption, you're probably not running on geek gas. You're probably running on a mixture of a bit of geek gas and a bit of converted fuel. Mm -hmm. um, because they, there's so much more energy there that it's almost difficult to run them less than that. So it kind of starts at 50% and it goes up from there. Okay, and so I, I hear you talking about overheating, but I, I'm 
quite conscious that Paul mentioned often that he had a car running and he didn't even have the water in the radiator and the fans weren't working. So is, is that something you've experienced or is this only yeah, something? They, they run cold. Define they, cold. Is there any hot part in the system? Because I think I think the rod itself has hot parts. Oh, the rod's it? hot. I mean, don't touch it. So you're gonna you're gonna burn yourself. Yeah, just, yeah. Sticking your hand on. I have burned myself viciously on heat reactors. They burn a lot worse than you think. You put a temporary gun over and you go, it's only 200 degrees Celsius, and mm -hmm. then you clip your arm across it. It will leave a right burn down your arm because it's not mm -hmm. just hot. Mm -hmm. um, but you should ex expect to see like a 50 to 100 degree temperature drop in exhaust gas okay that's you know, uh <laughs> that should be and it should be coming out of the reactor reasonably cool actually you know 50 degrees above ambient temperature so yeah, it's, it's bearable to touch the manifold you would say i've i've stood there with a running engine i did this at a demo in um in 2013 actually at the tesla energy conference in albuquerque um, I ran an engine and I buried the throttle at eight or nine thousand RPM, let it run for ten or fifteen minutes, and when I switched it off, I put my hand on the top of the engine mount on the piston head, on the fins, and then watched the crowd look at me and go, and then just left my hand there because actually it's not that hot. It's not as hot as you'd expect. Mm -hmm. It should all cool down. So, like when you're when you're first approaching an engine, the first thing to do is to make sure it runs mm -hmm. properly. And test the engine and get to know what it's dynamic what does it do how hot does it get go around with the temperature gun and measure all the temperatures then when you're running something with the with any fuel system it doesn't have to be geeky you put any crazy piece of tech onto the side of that engine watch your engine temperatures in all those key spots like around the spark plug and on the exhaust port the inlet manifold like where's the crank case where's the oil sitting in the bottom of the engine how hot's that Mm -hmm. And then when you're running something, you can quickly see, oh, I'm climbing in temperature, I'm getting hotter. Mm -hmm. And you can, you can, through experience, you can decide, oh, it's all right, it's a bit hotter. But it starts getting a lot hotter. You know that something is seriously wrong. And okay. generally, if it's getting really, really hot, it's because you've leaned down whatever your fuel mix is so far that you're now overheating your engine and you're, you're going to start damaging your valves. So Dan, in terms of breaking the the molecules down into a smaller gas, obviously, if you're getting something that's uh, methane, it's going to burn cleaner than something like diesel. Um, how I imagine it, and, and for those that don't know, uh, um, it, it, there's a lot of hydrodynamics going on. And the way I imagine it is something a bit like if you've seen those gold programs where they have the hydraulic riffles. Um, as as the fluid goes over, there's some shear, but also also there's some vorticity uh, created, and and this will do some charge separation. It will smash things up. It, it, is that kind of thing? Is is that a way to think about it? Like like the hydraulic riffles on a on a on a gold sluice, something like that, but actually yeah. horizontal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is as, as Paul said. This is a self sustaining plasma system. Right? You don't make a geek system do anything. You can influence it. But whatever you've built, it just does what it does. You have to change pipe work to change what's happening in, inside the reactor. But mm -hmm. everything spins. And I think some of the comments um, a bit further down on the, the chat I looked at earlier were talking about the Reynolds number. Yes. Yes, this, Go on is, about this is the all-important bit of magic. The Reynolds number is the speed of sound in a, in a liquid. So it's that particular gas or liquids, like density, affects how fast the speed of sound is in itself. And when you try to make a, a fluid travel down a pipe faster than the speed of sound in itself, it cavitates. Now, I had a, I had a long conversation with a friend of mine about this. He's got a degree in fluid dynamics. I said to him, do you know what happens uh, when you're a plumber and you want to put in radiators in somebody's house? You have to work out how fast you need the water to go down that pipe. How much water per second do I need to move around the system in my on-the-floor heating system or in my, in my radiators? Um, and if you push it down the pipe too fast, it stops. <coughs> right? It stands still. Now, the guy with the degree in fluid dynamics is like, how, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> You see this drawing, it's got two lines on the page. There's a, an aperture, the water's coming in, it gets a certain speed and it makes a vortex along here. 
and vortexes are drawn along the bottom of the page. And there's one there and one there and one there and one there and one there drawn on the page. So that's a two that's a two D cut through of a three dimensional shape for one second of time. So if you've got a vortex here and a vortex here and a vortex here, you've actually got a spiral. Right? You haven't got vortexes rolling along like this. <laughs> you've now got a spiral <laughs> corkscrewing through a pipe. So it's like a rolling vortex. It's a rolling vortex. You've actually taken the, the, the vortex is a three dimensional spiral like that wrapped up <laughs> inside the pipe and you've got a cross section of it, but you've just taken one little slice out of the middle of the pipe. You haven't, you're not looking at the pipe. You're looking at that bit through the pipe. Yeah. Yeah. So our mental picture says these vortexes go rolling along like this, and they're all independent little bits of chaos, but of course they're not. They're actually going like that. And, and didn't you say that actually um, this can leave a mark on the rod? If, if you get it right, what, what does it do? If the rod sticks, um, the early rods weren't floating rods. They were they had weld lugs on the end that kept them centered in the pipe and they were shoved up inside and they were a fixed piece of steel in the middle. So then you'd get a spiral wrapped around them and it would burn in a line where there's a, where there's a, hot, a hot line running around the rods. Once they were free floating, sometimes you get rings along a rod mm -hmm. instead of a spiral. And the rings is where this cool little effect comes in that they they teach to they teach to plumbers because if you don't know it you push too much water down the pipe and radiators don't get hot but they obviously don't teach it to fluid dynamics engineers <laughs> <laughs> you push harder and harder on the pipe but the, the liquid is already traveling at the speed of sound in the direction of the pipe so now you apply more force you put more energy in but it can't go any faster down the pipe so that force has to go somewhere else, which is now round the curve, which is why it suddenly starts to spin. So if you're already at the speed of sound and then you say, I want Mach 2, Mach 3, Mach 4, Mach 5, Mach whatever you like, you keep pushing. Now in, in plumbing, what happens is eventually it goes like that and it spins on the spot. Hmm. And a little tiny dribble of water comes out through the center and you get a drip out of the end, of a great big bore pipe <laughs> that you think Niagara Falls was going to come out of, and it has been up until now, and all of a sudden it just goes and it just stops and it just drips. <laughs> it won't come out the end of the pipe anymore. Mm -hmm. so you've, got a, you've got a heat reactor, and you've got to imagine it vertically with the rod this way, with some fuel gases traveling upwards coming to the rod. And there's only a little tiny gap there. And, uh, but it, of course, in this system, it's not just a push system, it's a pull system. In fact, it's more of a pull than a push system. Pull, yeah. So you've got a High vacuum at the top, something like 11 inches of mercury. Right, you'll have to convert to whatever units you want to. Paul worked in inches of mercury, so I used to have to report to Paul in <laughs> Fahrenheit mercury. So that's that's where I'm at. That's that's what my brain's registered them all as. So it's 11 inches of mercury, which is like halfway to outer space. It's 36 inches of mercury is outer space. So you know you're a third of the way to outer space at the top of the reactor. You've got about the same vacuum at the bottom of the reactor because there's a bubbler over here or a carburetor and you're holding vacuum in the bubbler. But the rod in the middle, has got a little tiny gap. Because of the little gap, you've got this huge venturi. So the vacuum in the center is now extreme. It's huge. And there's a like a one inch vacuum differential across the reactor. Typically, if you, put, if you put a gauge top and bottom, you'll have a slightly higher vacuum at the top than you would at the bottom. I expect that. That one inch of mercury is good. So it's going through that gap and it's trying to exceed the speed of sound. And as soon as it does that, it has to now go around in a circle. But once it goes flat and it's traveling around in this like little one millimeter gap there, well, it, it can't go forwards. It gets stuck. So it just has to keep accelerating faster and faster indefinitely until something gives. And normally what happens is your, your gas is traveling one way on the inside of that pipe and your exhaust gas is now going the other way. One's going down, one's up, mm -hmm. in and out to each other. So you build up such an enormous charge that it arcs out and you get your fuel breakdown in that moment. 
So that's actually part of the process. So where this thing spins around, there's this magnetohydrodynamic effect, yeah. uh, these charged iron ions, and this leads to this discharge, and that that actually electrically breaks down the fuel, is what you're saying. Yeah, you you, you lose enough electrons. Right. You okay. Pulling ele electrons off of off of your fuel. Okay. So your the nucleus is only balanced out by the cloud of electrons. If you take a few electrons away, you've got plasma. Mm -hmm. If you take a few more away, you've got a higher energy state plasma and you take a few more away and eventually the nucleus to charge densities in the nucleus and the charge densities in the cloud don't balance anymore. Mm -hmm. And they get to a critical point where the nucleus has to give up being one nucleus and it becomes two nucleuses. You get a bunch of electrons there and there. Mm -hmm. Now they're a little bit happier, but you've got twice as many particles. I mean, it, this, it's got more this, particles. This, it releases the vacuum lock and it runs forward along the rod accelerates mm -hmm. and does it again and then it'll make a ring there and it'll break mm -hmm. and it'll go up the rod and it'll make another little ring and it'll break and it'll go up the rod and the trick is I mean, to stop it where you want it and not anywhere else it's yeah dan, dan it's experimentally proven that some um nuclei that are stable to the end of time if they're given sufficient uh removal of their electrons and uh i think in the case of um uh th thallium 205 if you remove all the electrons it immediately decays to to uh lead 205 and it'll, it'll over a period of time be uh decay back to thallium 205 um there are a number of other ones that have been pr proven to do this but actually in matsumoto's book uh who's a nuclear scientist his whole theory relies on the fact that when you get enough charge separation it will actually polarize the protons and then the protons will separate into a, a neutron and a positron and a neutrino and that the existing electron and the positron that's released uh, from the uh, proton and the, the neutrino form what, what's called an iton and this is the the structure of ball lightning according to him and i'm going to be meeting him in april uh, and uh, in japan for a week uh, so um, and I will be recording that. And so I will be discussing this technology along yeah. with him as well. Yeah, that sounds that all sounds very in line with, with what I see happening in there from Paul's descriptions from, from sitting there listening with I've got a headset that listens to the transmissions off the reactor. Yeah. And, and, and actually, when those things blow up, actually, when that when those things there. blow up, they produce noise in electrical equipment, as you've described it. So describe actually. So so before we get to that point, can you describe what you see happening as it comes off the end of the rod? Uh, uh, so there's a couple of questions here. A lot of people are asking, have you seen the plasma? Have you seen the plasma ball? In in which case, like, have you physically seen it or have you seen other reports of it? And then um, what did I it look like? I haven't seen the, the bright light plasma ball. Mm -hmm. um, I, it's been pretty rare that I've had sight glasses on the back of reactors to look in there. And as we discussed earlier, you don't really want to be sticking your face yeah, so just, like just the, the safety... end of a plasma reactor on a regular basis. Well, this isn't... Yeah, I'll, I'll talk about this at another time, but uh, I would project that you would get a beam coming out in the line of a sight glass if it was directly above where the ball was that uh, could yeah, there's, extend there's to 700 meters. Magnetic fields and other things coming out. It's, it, it's, I'm, I'm less worried. Come out of it, it's going to come out of it there. I'm less worried about the EM fields. I'm more worried about whatever else is coming out, the, 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 well, yeah. the inline. But if, you, if I'm like, my kind goes, oh, if I've got big, powerful EM fields, they may have other things as well. Yeah. So so we discussed, <laughs> if you're going to do that, let's have a, a, a half mirrored glass or or something so that you're actually, you're looking like a, a, at it yeah, through look a periscope. Yeah, look at it that way onto a, to a mirrored surface that's yeah, looking into yeah. the side glass. Don't be clean. Yeah. And I say, you, you're going to burn yourself anyway. I mean, you spend enough yeah. time standing there controlling these things you get a little bit slack every now and then and you forget what you're doing you know you've there, there should be some off. coherent x-rays but they're not of high energy and there's there should be coherent uv as well so uh, certainly i would i would be behind a uv filter definitely for my eyes um uh, and def definitely have a a, a prism but, or but a, if, a mirror. There's, if there's suddenly a big bright light in there Mm -hmm. You won't need to look down the top of it to find out. Right. Because it will light up. You will know that it's freaking glowing. And you I actually talk, the you talked the, about I've this with the seen... actual outside of the reactor. You, you could actually observe the outside glowing can incandescently. Oh, no, that's a particular demonstration that's set up to make it do that. That doesn't, that doesn't just happen. Mm -hmm. That doesn't just happen. 
But it, 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 we, we discussed that this is similar to the observation when you're doing um, a Mars a straight gas or HHO straight gas. We established that it wasn't at the incandescent temperatures of tungsten and, and uh, uh, titanium to melt or vaporize them. It was something different that looked like it was incandescent, but actually, I think in the case of tungsten, it was below well below a thousand degrees. Or one of them was about two hundred and forty degrees, and the other one was, I don't know, about seven hundred degrees. But by, by they both look incandescent. But the hilarious thing was, I I tried to do something completely different, which was take indium, and indium melts at one hundred and fifty six point six degrees C. But even that was incandescent. Right? <laughs> clearly, clearly, this is not thermal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, okay. So, so, and, and just describe how you see it coming off the end of the rod then, the, the fluid dynamics there. That is, that is kind of the moment of chaos. You've, as it's come up and hit the, the tip of the rod, the tip of the rod has to be a nice shape to allow everything to go up round it and go into that little gap. And rod profiling is all about getting the fluid into the, into that gap that's your that's one of your power lockups like you, if you can't get it past the rod it ain't going to get to the engine you come into the back of it you've got a nice little dip in the back so the fuel is coming out of this this zone where it, it thinks it's in outer space mm -hmm. and it's no longer doesn't even know what matter is anymore it's completely rarefied and all of a sudden it falls into a void this is a complete void. The little dip there creates a pocket where everything falls into. So there must be a little field, there must be a little rotating toroid, toroid sitting right on the back of the rod that everything's going right, I'm in and I'm collapsing and I'm spinning round. And, and Paul said that the, the energy pickup, this thing's breathing electrons in from outside of the system. They're traveling in layer by layer through the, through the metal work of the reactor. They're getting to the rod and then they're going up the rod and coming out the back of the rod. Yeah, and you see, when, when you're saying that, you're, you're saying that electrons are coming in through at least two fairly thick layers of metal. Yeah, because they're, they're, but they're a positive, then it's the metal, then it's negative, then there's a gas layer, then there's the outside of the surface, which would be positive, and the inside of the surface, which is now negative, and a gas layer, and the rod. And the boys have put probes in, and they've gone, oh, it's this voltage, positive and negative, and it's, 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 because you've got a contraflow of gases creating an electrical charge between themselves, that you're getting electrons trying to move that way. Yeah, but you're saying, you're talking about within the concentric pipes, but you're hmm. actually saying that the, the, the electrons are coming from outside of that zone. Outside, in the environment around you, mm -hmm. it's being picked up. There's a rotating field on the outside that is effectively scooping up energy from its surroundings. Mm -hmm. It's being bombarded by electrostatic energy in the atmosphere you know, you've got 100 volts per meter and you can all turn on the radio and hear white noise there's a huge amount of energy swimming around outside the reactor that it's bringing in and it's accelerating it forwards and around in various spirals in different directions until it gets to the rod and then it's driven upwards through the rod till it gets to the back of the rod where it come out the end so if you're now going here's a neutron and here's a proton and you launch them into a little void on the back of the rod, they come together, pick up an electron, and now you have a new piece of gas. Now, Dan, it's interesting you said stat uh, static electricity, or rather the noise on your radio, because according to Shishkin, that he, he is arguing that static electricity is exotic vacuum objects. These are the ubiquitous elect, elect, uh, charge clusters that are in the environment, and we know they can be in the neutral form. And so if these things can interact with the charge clusters and bring them in in neutral form, you have a means by which you can bring electrons into the, into the reactor from the far field, but it, yeah. they're not bound by electrical like uh, conductivity issues. But when they get into the ball lightning or this vortex toroid structure, it can then become part of the collective resistance mm -hmm. is futile. Basically, yeah. <laughs> 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 it's, just, it's, just scooping, it's just scooping up available energy so don't mind me you don't need yeah. this i'm just gonna but just on, on, on that note you know that there is a, a new technology that the japanese have invented which actually is is using uh a transition uh phosphor 
uh, including uh, with strontium aluminate. Uh, and they actually have developed a screen which you can use to um, show static electric fields in real time on, on a film. Wow, I want one. Yeah, so uh, I've got the paper. I'll talk about this, but uh, I would like to see this being used to investigate the potential static fields around uh, um, and the gradations of that, if it's possible. So I want to get them on board, maybe. They're, they're Japanese, and I can reach out to my Japanese contact. So, um, OK, so th th that's that's a, an overview. So what happens when it gets into the... We, we've created our geek gas, and we've got it propagating into the cylinder. What, what does Paul, in your view, or your in, uh, uh, interpretation since... What do you see is happening and to the gas? Is it, it, I mean, it's a mix of everything, right? Or is it something like a clusters? Or it, 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 he also talked about it, when you have geek gas, you, it's not so important. To, or you don't need to have the spark plug sparking. So, like, what are we talking about here? Is going on? It's if you're playing with a little generator and you need a spark plug. Um, when you're playing with a high compression petrol car engine like a big Chevy engine that's got loads of compression behind it, then it will diesel. The, the, ignition, the, the, the ignition temperatures and pressures aren't that high. They're a little bit lower than petrol. So with a big, fat, chunky, heavy American muscle car engine, yeah, you don't need a spark plug because it'll just go off under compression and then it implodes before it explodes. So it didn't, it didn't buck. And what, he was, what he was talking about was having a... A demonstration where somebody said how slow can you run this engine and he he's like okay come on over and have a look and he was standing there and he's he's got it idling at about eight rpm right so there's a there's a fan on the flywheel that's going no, 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 no. just just turn it around ever so slowly right and it's not making any real noise or doing anything it's just going six cylinders <laughs> just Mm, oozing away at some phenomenally high vacuum because you have to shut all the valves to make it slow down. It's, you open the valves to go faster and you, you close them to slow down and he's pulled some unbelievably high vacuum on this thing and it's just going... And I was like, well, well, well go on then, start up. It's like it's running. There you go. <laughs> it's just going... <laughs> and then you open the throttle and it goes... Wah! Fantastic. So, so from my point of view, it's like if if you're getting a higher efficiency, if you're getting thirty percent efficiency, fifty percent efficiency, it, when you're burning fuel at at that level of efficiency, and you're having clean burn, i.e., you're 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 taking longer hydrocarbons and and like petrol or diesel, and you're making them burn as clean or better than say methane, you've then got an argument where the internal combustion engine with this modification becomes cleaner than almost any hydrocarbon burnt for production of electricity for say an electric engine. Um, because, you know, other than those people that are lucky enough to strap their vehicles uh, directly to a nuclear generator, uh, um, or they happen to have their own personal wind turbine, but most electric cars are running on, on coal or gas. Uh, if they're lucky, <laughs> yeah. yeah there's not enough. There's not enough lithium in, in the world to make enough Norway. batteries. You took all the lithium on the planet. You've only done half the cars once. Yeah, once, and that's when their batteries are done. They're done, and there ain't going to be any more. Yeah, so but you're cool. missing the point. They want everyone to have self-driving cars, and you rent it out on an app, yeah. and it's all shared. Yeah, so yeah. The, the intention is that not many people have personal transportation. You'll have shared transportation if you're a good little boy. Um, <laughs> so. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, 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 you check the right boxes. To... Yeah. Yeah. So, go on. Let's let's swing back round onto, yes. onto the heat side of things. What's happening in the engine? Well, the burn in the engine is obviously doing something. It isn't just as simple as the gas is burning in the engine. Um, there's an electrical connection between that source of combustion of whatever is happening there, the engine, and back to the reactor. Right. It's all built out of copper, copper pipe and steel pipe. It all has to be electrically conductive in order to work properly. Um, and if you isolate the burn in the engine, it stops working. Right. Right. So there must be something happening in there. And we have these very high oxygen levels. Well, so this, this... then that's there. Those gases aren't present in the pipe going to the engine. 
we are bringing in air so you'd have some oxygen but if that, it was that, like, Dan can I stop you because you've said something incredibly interesting there you said unless you have if you have electrical isolation of the chamber it doesn't seem to work doesn't and work. so so there must be a feedback loop between the the thing that's assembling these clusters and the thing that's breaking them and yeah. th this is what happened in the PAP engine, which it is a ball lightning cluster based technology. You build the clusters and then you blow them up by it, he, he used a number of methods. He used a gliding arc discharge after, you know, someone mm. complained because he was using a, a, a gamma or, or X-ray source to create the clusters. Then you blow up the clusters. When the clusters blow up, when they were forming, they release thermal energy. And when they blow up, they suck uh, thermal energy in from the environment. But there is an electron exchange in both instances. And actually, you, you get a gain there to a certain degree if you have uh, nuclear uh, changes as well. Uh, and if you go to the limit where you actually break down nucleons uh, into light and leptons, of one of which can be electrons. Um, you might have a, a flux, an extra flux of electrons where you had to bleed that to ground. And so um, if, if there is a requirement for that electrons to be fed back to the point of generation of these clusters. Exactly. OK, so exactly. We, can, we can discuss so There that. is a whole thing happening inside the engine. Yeah. Um, we also know that there's excess oxygen. Well, the excess oxygen isn't in the geek gas. If it was just hydrogen and we were taking in air, we would use up the oxygen in the air that's coming in through the air management valve, combining it with the oxygen, and we would have the hydrogen, sorry, and we would have water, but we wouldn't have excess oxygen. It's present in the exhaust gas before the reactor, and there's no difference in emissions between before and after the reactor. So it isn't happening going back down through the reactor on the outside. Therefore, something has to be happening in the engine where we're getting a surplus of oxygen. And I've had 21%. It's very difficult to get to 21%. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul's record is 23.5. Mm -hmm. And that was running 20% crude oil and seawater. So right. clearing up oil spills and stuff is a brilliant idea. One of the best things to run a big, heavy engine, if you're running geek, the best thing you can put in there is 20% crude oil and the rest of seawater. Well, well, of course, if you've got... Um a hydrocarbon there's no oxygen in there it shouldn't be much <laughs> um but if you're putting seawater in there immediately getting a lot of oxygen so oxygen is being added in that process yeah. so we need to understand when we become to do some elemental and, and process gas analysis on this is the oxygen coming out of water content in there and it's being liberated and the hydrogen's being captured in some way maybe making more oxygen by the cno process or something um, or, it, it, you know, it, is it you know, alpha conjugate going on I, to the carbon? I suspect sort of? it's being created. I think you've got hydrogen and helium and things between the two being mm -hmm. formed as geek gas. Mm -hmm. And when that combusts, it's, it's completely unstable and mm -hmm. you end up forming hot oxygen atoms in the engine during combustion. I I mean, there's a lot that's obviously going in, but so I've, I've got 21% oxygen and I'm running on petrol with no water being added. Yeah. I did a lot of my work just on petrol to isolate the variable, but you've added a load of water. Yeah. So it's like if you've got 18 to 20% oxygen and you're sending in petrol, well, you must be making oxygen somewhere. You know, even if you've made a load of water through the combustion of the fuel, I, th I think the helium still, is the helium still going to come from somewhere. The helium is the easiest thing to establish. So, like, because it's non combustible and it's non reactive. So, if we pass the uh, gas um, that's coming out through something that absorbs hydrogen or that um, combusts it and turns it to water, and then we go through a dryer, a, 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 a trap, or whatever, and the, the resulting gas is a mass four <coughs> non-combustible gas then mm. it must be helium <laughs> right and and we have a device although it's under repair at the moment that will be able to precisely tell us that that is mass four so we don't want we don't want to get any d2 there sorry any d we don't want to get any hd sorry d ht we don't want to get any uh yeah, it would need to be dd or it need to be ht so exactly those are the only things that could come exactly through what has to be in there yeah, and those those things are both combustible. So you can yes. you can go through a catalyst, 
and, and remove those out of place. So the bit you'd have left over is helium. Once we've got helium in there, it's like, well, there shouldn't be a lot of helium in, in the source fuel or in the air. So then you can start having a conversation about, you know, we know that alpha conjugate nuclei occurs. We know that oxygen is by far, it's nearly 50% of the Earth's crust. And therefore, it's it's reasonably likely that the process produces that. Okay, so is, is there anything like, so... so We've got a we've got a potentially cold running reactor or a cooler running reactor. There's something going on the the, the uh, cylinder. There's lots more to learn there. Um, we we have two different modes: the vaporizing carburetor, and and we we have this geek gas mode. There's some mystery about electron con electrical conductivity between the the cylinder and between the 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 uh, geek reactor part of it, and and, and so forth. Um, and you can have a mixture of fuels. What's the heaviest fuel you have personally run or seen run? Golden syrup and ginger beer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so dirty sugar. <laughs> I, I like running my engines on ginger beer. All the right. things you make a thing. I used to make ginger beer as a, as a kid. And then mm. I made ginger wine. And then I learned how to brew an immortal ginger beer plant that will not die no matter how much alcohol you put in it. And I could mm -hmm. brew a liquor that has 20% ethanol in it. Mm -hmm. At which point it's for geek fuel. Right, right. So I don't need anything else. I can just make ginger wine, drink what I want, pour the rest in the engine and it'll bloody well run. <laughs> <laughs> if, it's, if you get a bad batch, put it in the engine. <laughs> <laughs> nothing, nothing is wasted. <laughs> nothing is wasted around there. Um, <laughs> urine, battery acid. Um, <coughs> yeah, you can't run old engine oil. Synthetic engine oils don't work. But gearbox oil will go through. Right. Um, antifreeze won't work. It won't eat antifreeze. Doesn't so like it. So something I'm interested in is uh, used cooking oil. Do, do we have to make that into a diesel first or can you just use it as it is? Do you need a no, detergent no. in there? It'll eat whatever you like. The question is, can you get it into a vapor? Right. Can you turn it into a vapor at a high enough density, stably, continuously and quick enough to feed your reactor? It's well, I, not I about can what the reactor will eat. It's about I, what can you get into it. I can certainly tell you that in most frying shops, there is a layer of oil everywhere. <laughs> so oh, yeah. that oil is getting into a vapor form somehow. Now, of course, those you might need to have a different sort of vaporizer, like pre-stage, like maybe using some of the direct gas. I don't know. You might might need a different combination there um, to get because you, you'd need the oil at a couple of hundred degrees, I imagine, to, to get it into be, a vapor. It's got to be cold going in the bottom of the reactor. Ah, oh, that's a very important ah. point. Yeah, I had, weirdly enough, the hotter it is outside, the colder bubble, bubblers get. Right. I, I had, because I think I've, I've done this in, in nine countries around the world now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. More, there's like a, I've lost track of how many workshops there is. This I move workshop on a regular basis. So I was stood in the Australian outback. It was 40 degrees outside at a metal tin roof on my workshop. It was 48 in the workshop. Uh, I had a bubbler full of 50-50 petrol diesel, and it froze solid. Right. It froze into a block of ice in mm. two minutes, sucking air and fuel, air through it, sending it to an engine and running it. I did it a couple of times, and then it turned into a gel and bonded the bubbler shut, and I never opened it again. But Paul did mention problems uh, in cold climates with with uh, the fact that it doesn't run so hot. Also for heating your car. Now I've got Ken Pratt suggesting here, and maybe some others. Uh, what about an ultrasonic driver to dry, uh, to produce yeah. particles? Of course, then you've got a complication <laughs> of driving that and the electrical energy. But I think that's marginal compared oh, no, they, to they the are generation. The, they are the way forwards. Right. What you can't do, or you can. The pain in the ass is that you buy a. 150 quid's worth of ultrasound fog unit, you stick it in a tank with some petrol, and three days later, the casing on the wire falls off, and you throw it in the bin and buy another one. Right. Right. And even if you just use it once and clean it and put it in a box, two months later, it's all gone hard. So, so the thing I learned about Suhas Ralkar, that if you do not match the the uh, impedance of, of the target of your ultrasonic horn with, with the driver, uh, if you go out of 95% coupling, the, the ultrasonic device will fall apart in, in short order. 
So uh, well, the, it... the fog units survive really well in petrol. They, they don't have a problem. And they atomize petrol beautifully. You just have to have the right depth. It's the wire. It's the plastic insulation on the wire that gives out. It gets attacked by the petrol. And even if you coat it with stuff, it, it just eats the plastic out. And then it goes brittle over time. So they're great. But you would actually have to build a, a custom unit where you've got something that's vibrating, sealed up inside your equipment, where you can send your fuel in and have it turn it into into fog. It's a really big yeah. engineering task. Yeah, so I mean, these, these are the things water. that there are people that know how to do. So, like, yeah. if you can do these things, great. But don't 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 waste money on a standard ultrasound thing. If you're doing that, put water in there mm -hmm. and use that to make water vapor and send it to a system as water. Right. As, as a sec as secondary vapor gas that you're yeah, passing. Yeah, have, yeah, have have petrol and water, and and blend yeah. the two. Yeah, um, I've run them on. Where you just put a little splash of petrol on top of the water, so there's yeah. a skim, and then you get a beautiful thick fog that comes off. Yeah. that you can you can light. You pour it out into a bowl and light it. It goes whoop, and the engine will run on that. Fantastic. It's just you knacker out the wiring on the unit so quickly you get the thing working and you'd be really really happy with it and then you'll put it away you walk out the shop three days later you'll come back and it won't really work anymore and you'll be standing there crying that you've just blown under into <laughs> yeah so, so can, disc can or, uh, you know 10 disc ultrasound unit for your system built a tank for it connected yeah. it all up debugged it got it working and then it died it's like so, so Ken Pratt has actually said here in the chat, he says, I used one, but I destroyed the transducer. And that's because of an impedance mismatch between the load and the actual uh, uh, PZT. So, <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a great idea, uh, um, but you need wow. to kind of like have a chamber where most of the work is, is, is the, the energy is transferred. It's not bounced back at the transducer. <laughs> okay. And you've identified other issues. Of course, if, if, if you're going to be looking at, other oils you wouldn't be looking at the sort of nature of petrol which likes to dissolve insulation now on the on the note of petrol of course you're talking about using ginger beer and stuff the energy content in ginger beer nominally is far lower than petrol petrol is this wonderful gift of nature where it has a load of hydrogens for its mass it doesn't need to be liquefied it's already a liquid like uh, like natural gas natural gas is better but it, it needs to be liquefied you lose a lot of energy producing the liquid and it has problem storage petrol is the oh, it's the most beautiful chemical uh, molecule there is for this so can we make it better if we can get 50 percent more out of it and we can lower the emissions we literally remove the biggest arguments for for what they're trying to push plus we don't have to reinvent the wheel it's literally you can you if you can make units that can genuinely go on to standard cars now i don't mean these things with these ultimately complex engine management systems because one they've got the engine management system that won't let you to oh, run it and paul talked yeah. about those he talked about those in his video um where they get in the way and they say you haven't got any emissions so let's shut you down because you're obviously not way. on <laughs> you basically you, you have to take everything off of the engine yeah, you, what you need an is an escort block. mark too. When you open it up and you can do the entire engine with one spanner and, yeah. and you, you, you can, can also fit block. your family in That's the it. bonnet. <laughs> All the exhaust system has to go. Right. All of the fuel system has to go. You want the header pipes. <laughs> There's a big engine and you know, even if it's injected, it's still got a butterfly valve thing sitting out front somewhere on the end of a header pipe and an air filter. So you kind of want that bit but you, you need to re-engineer all of that and everything from the back of the engine onwards, all the catalytic converters, all of the exhaust system, all its controls, everything. Mm -hmm. Throw it away because it's, you don't use any of it. Mm -hmm. You can't interact with it. It's all in the way. <laughs> and that's why um, I've had that conversation with various manufacturers and they're like, but we've spent 400 billion pounds in 10 years developing all of this stuff and you just told me to take it off and throw it away because it's shit and i'm like yes <laughs> sorry you've gone as far as you can go with catalysts yeah <laughs> we've got to do something else now and i thought you'd be happy that we saved you all that money you don't mm. need all of these things anymore just take it all off <laughs> give me solenoid control valves <laughs> a spark plug so, so Dan, you're because talking I'm about what you're talking about. Fucking leave me alone with that. <laughs> <laughs> you're talking. You're talking about what 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 one should take off. 
Now I'm going to I'm going to switch to asking for some people to step in and talk about their own experiences. I know some people have tried this in the past. Some people are here that are trying for you, like Hank, who's smiling there in the center of the frame for me. Um, and one one thing they've identified in their early experiences is that if you've got, for instance, a a mix of petrol and another fluid, which is not petrol, <clears throat> as the you've got more volatility. Sorry, <clears throat> you've got more volatility in the petrol, for instance, and that you know maybe gets vaporized first and although it entrains some of the other liquid and you get a change in mix so when you're setting the parameters of the inputs and outputs that changes over time and therefore yeah. so you, then you need maybe a carburetor in there and control it and stuff so like how how do you <laughs> how have you dealt with that historically uh drip fed bubblers or carburetors okay so you maintain the, the uh, bubbler, you're, you're basically the bubbler is not a fuel tank right that's what everybody sees. They see a fuel tank mm -hmm. and they expect it to run all the way down to the bottom. Yeah, yeah. A bubbler is the float bowl from your carburetor. It's a reservoir of fuel. It has an airstream going through it. Its job is to convert liquid fuel into a vapor and deliver it to the engine. It's not a fuel tank. So you start off with an amount. As it runs down, it sucks off all the lightweight fuels. They come off first. It goes down and down and down and you start to run out of a physical volume of liquid so your fuel density starts to go down and then you end up with a chunk of heavy fuel at the bottom that it can't eat because it can't vaporize it so you have to maintain the depth in the bubbler by continuously adding a little bit of fuel then you have a fuel see, tank. See, see hank discovered this manually by manually putting in a bit of extra petrol <laughs> yeah I, I used to do that i had a squirty bottle you know the um, <clears throat> ketchup bottles and things from a yeah, yeah yeah right so I have one of those full of petrol and i go Zook! every now and then and i change my valves and i'm running i'm like oh i'm running out of i'm getting low on fuel i always be marker all right need a little bit of fuel and i just keep the thing running and extend my run time when i go oh this is the amount of fuel <coughs> i got in the bubbler it's reached a sweet spot in the run now i will want to turn on a little dripper yeah. So, 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 so uh, for those people that drip. maybe don't get it, like a saline drip when when you're in the doctors, it's it's like just keep continuously just dripping keep something drip, in. Drip, it. drip, drip, yeah. drip. That's and and again, you could have a control valve on that that changes the drip valve. And you that's know? exactly what you should have. Is you've got hold of the, the air valve on the bubbler, mm -hmm. and you've got right. Uh, this is the amount of air I will send into that depth of fuel. It will atomize the fuel, pick it up, mm -hmm. bring it to the engine. Now mm -hmm. I want to maintain the composition of my donor fuel. Well, if you've got a single, a single atom fuel, if you have an ethanol in there, it's just ethanol. Mm -hmm. So it's going to continuously vaporize and go down and down and down in the level. And it'll be really stable fuel delivery. But you've got petrol with a whole range of molecules in different sizes, with different vaporization temperatures. They're under vacuum, they're being hit by concussion, so all the lightweights come off first. And you have to get that to cycle until it's a nice, stable thing and you have to go up oh, at which point will i engage my power do i start opening my air management valve and my bubbler right at the beginning of the run on on this tank full of fuel when will i put it under load once i've got it under load and i've got a, a vacuum range do i want to let it keep going and eating down through its fuel as it eats down through the fuel you have to close the valves to bring back the air because your fuel's going down and you're maintaining a fuel air mix so you're closing down valves so your vacuum's coming up and at some point you go okay that's my vacuum i will run at i've got this much air to my bubbler this much air to my engine and now i want to start adding fuel to maintain that that dynamic if you've got that set right it's a geek reactor if you've got that <clears> set wrong it's a vaporizing carburetor well, let's hope it's a geek reactor because one of the things I'm very interested in, and I know uh, Sho reached out to me uh, yesterday morning. Uh, I'm sure he he catch the the video stream uh, um, in the Japanese morning. Uh, he was thinking about the Fukushima wastewater, and like if you're dripping in the fuel, you could also, for instance, drip in contaminated water and yeah. process it along the way. Um, sure. But we yeah. need to first establish that we can break down. Uh, at the nuclear level and we must be in the state where we have that ball lightning at the end it, it can't be a variation so. of that. i don't think you want anything less than a full spec full <clears throat> operational reactor mm -hmm. running in, in 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 the higher end of it mm -hmm. not a little honda engine tickling away 
with a low level reaction because you don't mm. need much reaction to convert fuel into mm. something clean burning and run an engine. All this stuff of making power off of geek reactors or seeing power running down mm. gas lines or big output fields, all this happens in, in a whole different class of working with these systems. When you've got one that's actually set up to run an engine mm. and run it efficiently and cleanly and evolve power, that tends to negate some of the other factors or some of the other effects because you, you're focusing all that energy into breaking down fuel at a high enough speed to get that engine running under load. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so they're kind of, you're going either in one direction or you're going the other. We, what we're talking about doing is setting them up to do all the other weird and wonderful things that, that Paul looked at and kind of going through and learning about those. So we wouldn't be building reactors designed to put an engine under load we'll be building reactors that actually be crap for that because that's mm. where all the other stuff happens. So they are kind of mutually independent of each other. Well, so so um, just to lay my cards on the table, what I would like to do uh, is to establish uh, between us as a collective, what kind of levels of efficiency can be proven to be achieved uh, and uh, whether it's any nuclear effect. The nuclear effect may be the first approach. So I've spoken to Dan about him coming to California, uh, using his expertise with some support, which he'll need um, <clears throat> to build uh, a reactor. It'll be a fairly si large, uh, um, uh, not a single stroke engine. Uh, and he'll maybe talk about why that is. And we'll attach that to a pump. And so what we want to do is establish first, if we get any transmutation, then we will put in without the modification, the fuel that it is designed to run, let's say it's petrol, and then we will pump a volume of water up a number of meters and then let it, let it run down back into the chamber. So we know the exact energy because as Dan will probably describe, um, when you are running in GEET, it doesn't perform necessarily in the same way it's designed to run under a normal, uh, uh, not a lean mix, but a, a dirty mix or <laughs> yeah. not trying to burn it perfectly. Uh, and so, so you might not get the rated power, but I'm not interested in the rated power. I'm interested in the amount of water it can pump for a volume of fuel you had to buy, right? Exactly. And so first, firstly, we see how much, let's say we've got a three meter head. We want to raise it three meters and let it run downhill back into the chamber. We, we know how much it takes to move that amount of water through the flow valve at the top and, 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 and go round in the loop. And we let's say we give it, uh, you know, 300 mil of fuel and we let that run and we we do the volume of water. Now we put our GEET reactor on there and it might only be doing 10 percent or 50 percent or 70 percent of the amount of movement. But for the same amount of fuel I had to buy, were we able to shift 40, 50 percent more water yeah. up ahead of three meters? And in that case, go for a break. Otherwise, my, the, the head of pressure over here will... Uh... <laughs> no worries. So I'll, I'll, I'll just describe that. You you go and do your little boys' room thing. So, so yeah, I don't know if people want to weigh in on that idea, but the idea is to basically one: is it nuclear? If it is, that opens up a whole load of new opportunities. And then two: can we prove that it's it's uh, be able to raise more water for a, a given volume of bought fuel up a certain amount of height? And if that does, then we know it's it's producing. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50%. If it produces like more, if it lifts more water than you could technically lift with a, a, a piece of fuel, if you used all of the fuel that's in there, then we know that it is, is it's producing over unity. Um, if, if, if it's producing more movement of water than all the fuel that we have to say, add some water and some the water is adding some gain to the process, then we also know that it is effective so is producing over unity and in this instance it's it's a mean of storing energy actually if you can use undesirable fuels you can burn them and, and lift water up into a reservoir or as a lot of people are proposing these days you can um lift sand out of a mine and then you let the sand go in a bucket and go all the way down the mine shaft there's very many ways you can do this gravity storage of energy uh, for uh, producing vast amounts of energy um, uh, in the interim time. Um, so, um, Hank, I'm going to ask you to go first. Uh, if anyone else wants to talk about their experiences, please use the button to raise their hand. 
And if anyone's got any questions that they immediately want to ask right now so that we can get um, Dan to answer them when he returns, uh, that would be great. Uh, and those people on YouTube, if you want to answer your questions right now, there is uh, 25 people on YouTube and we've got 23 people in the room here. So uh, does anyone want to uh, put their hand up? Do you know how this works down in the bottom? You have uh, reactions and you can go and recognize hand gestures or you can, sorry, you can uh, raise your hand. Okay, I think Hank's, Hank's going to go first. Uh, so Dan, uh, Hank, could you share your experience so far? Uh, what you found works, what doesn't work? and your top questions. Unmute, okay. Everybody can hear me now? Great. Um, yeah, well, I just have a, a small motor that I added with a GEET reactor uh, and it just doesn't work. <laughs> it's the first try and I tried various rods, uh, but um, what Dan already told, uh, there is mystery going on and it has to, you have to go on to experimenting a lot. Um, but yeah, what what do I wrong? And that's the problem. I'm not in a workshop with you, so it's not not simple to to show. And I you can show I can show you, but the problem probably is that you have to be there to feel what's going on there. But uh, the question is, what should I never do? Uh, and maybe I do it. So what should I never do uh, to make the engine not work? Um, does it run as factory standard? When you what put you the mean with... carburetor on and the original exhaust on, does the engine... uh, Well, the car I had one with a, a defective carburetor, so I took that one off and it's just uh, feeding uh, from the reactor into the engine uh, yeah. with a... So it's a direct feed, so no carburetor. It's it's just the bubbler uh, and 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 the gate and and the and the motor. And I started with adding some some petrol in the um, um, close to the engine, just yeah. pour in some petrol, just to make it start. Then I closed the vol the valve uh, at the at the intake, and then it starts running through uh, the gate uh, and 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 the bubbler, and then it. I can make it run for 15, 20 minutes, but there is no heat effect. That's what you, that was already an important uh, remark that when the engine starts running wild, you can say then the heat kicks in. Uh, up till now, it doesn't work that way. So, but uh, yeah, the, the question, probably it's, it's, uh, it's a difficult question because of what you say, there are many variables you can, uh, can work on. Uh, maybe it's a, 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 a simple one. What is this? The tube is 15 millimeters and my uh, rod is uh, 14 millimeters. So there's one millimeter gap that should be okay, I believe. Um, and it's 10 centimeters long for petrol. It should be okay, I, I believe. Um, but what can be wrong on the rod itself more? Is it in the, not in the right position in the in the tube? Should it be in the um, middle? Uh, should I fix it? I, I have hundreds this, of questions. These this small is, questions. This is like the classic, the classic moment in the start of the meat journey. It's not the reactor. The reactors are not that important. They are the least of your concern. Okay. Ah. <laughs> if you, <laughs> this, we're going to update the plans on the reactors because um, the free plans have got this huge, great, big, long thing. It's about that big, All right? And it's a really, really awful reactor. Paul always said it was the worst reactor design he ever put together. Um, but it's 20 years out of date, so we're going to put out some new plans in the next week or so when I get down to editing my stuff and getting it out there, which is the right size reactor. And there's only three sizes. Um, I reference them by the size of the outer pipe. So there's a three-quarter inch reactor, three-quarter inch outer pipe with a three-eighths inner, half-inch reactor, oh. half-inch. Uh, one inch out of pipe with a half inch and then a an inch and a quarter so you have these three sizes that are appropriate for a wide range of engines and then you have to fit them to the engine and that is where all the madness starts right so everybody immediately looks to the reactor but it's everything but the reactor that is the problem okay, okay. 
So you just build one of the three standard reactors and then it's about getting it on the engine. And the first thing you do, don't ever put a reactor on an engine that doesn't run as factory standard. If you can't make it run as normal, the chances are there's something wrong with the engine. I, so the first thing I do is I take the head off and I clean it. And I clean the inside of the engine, especially when it's some old knackered piece of that you've had lying around somewhere, because that is the standard donor engine. I'm going to do this project. I don't want to blow two and a half thousand pounds on a brand new Honda original generator with a brand new engine. So I'll either buy a 150 quid Chinese, co Chinese copy of one that's new. And their valve time and their valve clearances are all wrong. They clatter. They don't like it, they don't run very well. They're really nastily set up, so you need to set them. But more often you grab an old, an old engine out of a shed somewhere and it's full of crap. <laughs> I put, one of my friends gave me this lovely engine, it's a race tuned engine off of, off of a um, go-kart. GX160, race tuned, it's got the special high balanced um, cams in it. It's got uprated springs in it. It's got, it's had the bore drilled out and glazed and sprayed with Teflon so that they could run it hotter on a lean burn and do six and a half thousand RPM without worrying about damaging the engine. But that Teflon coating stops the reactor from running because there's a connection from the burning fuel back to the reactor. So if you've got an old, old, nasty, dirty little engine, then its valves are burnt out. They're all carbon dark, they leak. Your piston rings are worn, so they leak. And then you're gonna shove a huge high vacuum on this thing and expect it not to leak. Well, it leaks, because <laughs> it's old. So <laughs> Dan, can I just, just clarify the two learning points there? One is if you get carbon deposition in the, the old engine, this can have a problem. And yeah. the, the other major learning point uh, uh, is, is any leaks and stuff. Yes. The, the, the other point you can talk about um, later, uh, yeah. Um, but but uh, yeah, the, the carbon and and the leak. So you, what you do is you strip the engine first. Strip it. Take the head off. Clean it. Clean the top of the piston. What do you use to clean? What do you use to clean? WD forty, petrol, and elbow grease. Yeah, like normal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Whatever. Patience. yeah. Patience. <laughs> Patience. Well, this was an, uh, an, an, a fairly new Chinese machine, <coughs> uh, very uh, small one, small generator. So, but the carburetor was uh, gone. Uh, right. The new petrols these days ruin your carburetor, so uh, I couldn't use it anymore. So I, I throw it away. So the engine yeah. didn't didn't run before. Yeah, yeah. that's uh, maybe always uh, the, maybe half an hour. The first, so the first one to look at is: Does this thing run properly normally? Yeah, well, it runs proper. Yeah, well, I cannot check it anymore because the carburetor is gone, but it, <laughs> it, 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 it did run uh, properly. Uh, yes. Once, uh, once upon a time. Yeah. Um, so that that it, it was it was new. It did run. So it was OK. And now the carburetor was gone. So, yeah, I had to throw it away. Yeah. Uh, that, that was point one. And so but you you, you have more problems uh, in well, this setting. It's the thing, you know, I, I regularly take the spark plugs out and have yeah. a look. If you've been running on weird and wonderful stuff, you're putting diesel and water and coffee and God knows what in there, right? Because it likes, we were talking about fuel densities and energy densities. Water's crap. It's awful. It has no yeah. energy density in terms of geek gas because geek gas is about molecular density of fuel. Yeah. Carbon, sulfur, nitrogen, oxygen. How big an atom have you got? Because you're taking that atom apart to make geek gas. So if you've got water and you put sugar in it, well, for, for one cubic centimetre of water that was turned into vapour and sent through the reactor, if it's got a load of sugar in it, it's got more atoms of carbon in it per cubic centimetre. Mm -hmm. So it has a higher energy density. So the more stuff that is in what you're sending through, it's a, it's a vacuum-based system. It needs to have a high vacuum in order to work. And if you want to create more torque, you have to open the valves and send in more air and fuel yeah yeah so you can only have as much torque as you have vacuum yeah so you want to minimize the amount of liquid you're trying to send in there with the amount of air and have the highest energy density in terms of not combustible density it's it's how many atoms 
and what weight are they that's that's going into my reactor you know how easy is it to break that fuel up into a vapor and get it to the reactor and is it arriving there with some weight behind it or yeah. is it all, is it all empty stuff um when you're playing around putting random things through it there's a tendency to get a lot of carbon build up in the engine very very quickly especially if you sucked half a gallon of coffee into your engine and watched it spray out the back of it <laughs> you've yeah. basically got you've got toffee in there now <laughs> and when you when you cook when you cooked toffee to the inside of the engine and you take the head off and it goes <laughs> yeah yeah oh yeah. i know it's not working yeah. Um, but yeah, if you're just sucking petrol through it, you can get liquid fuels going through that build up on the spark plug, and then you don't get a spark. Yeah, okay. The, the, it can be, no one, but... You've got to go yeah. down, go go from what's the ethereal magic behind how a geek reactor works and go back down to, well, what's the engine? Do yeah, well, the engine, engine is not a problem. I can start it quickly, but then uh, you then the, the geet effect is not kicking in and that's what you're saying it it's not uh in one uh, the reactor is not a problem but there's more things going on so i i yeah. can start the engine and can run but when what what do i have to tune or change to make this geet process starting i mean it's heating up everything gets hot yes and i can uh so but what is the, the, it, it's just a matter of find, finding of course uh but what do i have to change uh, so that two sides of the system you've got the fuel side and the exhaust side so you've got the fuel going into the reactor type composition stability density air fuel ratio going into the reactor yeah. it's gone through the reactor it's had a conversion it's come out of the yeah. reactor that's to do with rod length What's your fuel and what's your rod length? Have you converted your, your donor liquid into something you want to burn as geek gas? Because if the rod's not right, then it isn't making what you want. Yeah, but, right? but, but you can put a dirty great big rod in there and you'll get a reversing field effect and you'll get the reactor to kick in. You tune the rod, that's that's later down the line. But it, so it's come round to the inlet of the engine. So now you're mixing geek gas or whatever you've made with air. So you've got a second air fuel mix. You're trying to control two air fuel mixes at the same time. One is trying to set an air fuel mix that the reactor wants to see to do its job. And the other is sending an air fuel mix that the engine wants to see to be able to run and feed back to the reactor. So any of that setting is off, your fuel side just falls away. Yeah. Okay. And then you've got your exhaust side. So there's a pipe coming off of the engine that delivers the gorgeous gas to the reactor. That pipe has to deliver exhaust gas in the right way and then it's got a muffler on the bottom which has an effect on the way the exhaust gas leaves the engine so when you go it's not working you've got an error down one side or other or both yeah, of that exactly. system. you've either got a yeah, pilot yeah. error <clears throat> in, in controlling of the air fuel mixes you've got an, a, a vacuum leak so can, can i can i interject because uh, some experienced people are commenting on what they've seen with the video that we published of hank's reactor so ken pratt says from your video hank your bubbler is too small to maintain the correct mix for very long so yep. he's uh, you've I, got a, he's got a very yeah. small jar um, and someone Just, else yeah someone else is asking don Vidin is asking about how is your vacuum holding uh, and eric is saying um in your question to you, Dan, what is the optimum uh, optimal vacuum to have in the engine? Uh, uh, different <laughs> because of different engine size, etc. If you can, if you can pull eleven inches of mercury, that's good. Mm -hmm. Going below, if you're run, trying to make them run lower than that, it's it's not really about design; it's about execution. It's how good is your machining. When you've made that rod, are you working to microns or millimeters? When you make the make a carburetor and it's sending air and fuel in to the to the bottom of the reactor, there's a little hole on the back of that carburetor that's regulating the amount of air. But I had a set of build bits that went up 
three millimeters, 3.2, 3.35, 3.5, 3. point something, where there were old bits that have been reamed through steel and stuff over years. And I've gone and measured a whole set of them and laid them up. So I've got eight bits running between three millimeters and four and a half. So then when I'm going to go right, I'm going to send a little bit more air to the back of my carver to what's my limiting air inlet. I might be taking one of those bits and just going through by hand and taking fractions of a millimeter off of my air inlet or minutely changing the shape of an air inlet or the profile, altering the way that the air is moving through it, how that's interacting with the fuel jet on the carburetor to ease more fuel into my airstream in a vapor state, not in big droplets of liquid. You know, it, it, it does really come down to that level of work. Dan, Dan, some people are asking about, um, can you not use some control valves and do it that way? And if not, why can't you just like, say, I can open my aperture this wide? I mean, I, I understand when you're you're trying to get an initial system running, but practically speaking, you need to have a system that you can control these parameters with some sort of predictability. If you had a, a high frequency, a high frequency solenoid, you could be controlling it, but you're trying to get, you're trying to pull air into this thing at a rate of knots without costing any vacuum and the only way to do that is to have a profiled air inlet it's the efficiency of the air if you've got a, a piece of steel or a piece of copper or something like that and you just drill a straight hole all the way through of one one size well you only get a volume of air through there at a certain vacuum and you, you basically you're losing vacuum trying to suck this air in. So I make fluted inlets like that, that come in and come down. There are beautiful Venturi inlets with a little shape on the outside so that I can shove quite a lot of air through that hole um, without costing myself a lot of vacuum. That's, that's why I can get an engine to run on load. If you just had a straight through hole, well, you can't get the volume of air through that you need and then your vacuum drops out. So the precision of your machining, the quality of the way you built the thing and put it together, the precision of how you profile the, the tip of the rod, this allows you to run at lower and at less and less vacuums. So I can pull down to something like seven inches of mercury and my reactor is still running. My emissions are still saying, yes, this is, this is burning really clean. I might be starting to get the first signs of a, a partial reactor shutdown where I'm getting a little bit of fuel escaping my reactor but my my little honda generator is sitting there at equal to what honda can achieve and better but i've lost the vacuum but if you haven't really really worked on on the whole system all the way through and fettled it properly then your reactor will shut down with more vacuum so you'll need like 10 inches of mercury you go below that and it'll probably drop out on you so you've got to keep those vacuums up and the heavier the fuel the more vacuum you need. You're running diesel, you're going to need to be pulling 12 and 13 inches of mercury. Otherwise, you won't get fuel atomization. You won't vaporize out of the bubbler if you don't have enough vacuum. So it's all about evolving vacuum and managing that and not wasting your vacuum. If you've got a tiniest leak somewhere that is mm -hmm. sending air in, it's thinning down your air fuel mixes. <laughs> and it's a leak, so it's an uncontrolled inlet of extra air. You raise the vacuum, the leak gets bigger. You lower the vacuum, the leak gets smaller. So this thing is altering parameters within your system somewhere. And it can be intermittent. It, a piece of pipe can be vibrating. So as it goes that way, it leaks. And as it comes this way, it stops. So you, you, know, you, you, you have to really look at the quality of your build, how clean all your parts were, have you put it all together properly, have you debunked the leaks, do you have a spark plug, are you getting fuel into your reactor cleanly, is liquids jumping out of your bubbler, you've got a little bit of hose between your bubbler and your and the bottom of the reactor, is there any liquids traveling along there? Because you don't eat liquids, you eat vapor. You so I, eat I, I think what probably maybe would interest people is like, you know, there has to be a way to get to these things to be fairly reliable. Uh, and I would say that the French people that put this on a helicopter had confidence that it would continue to work when they're in the air, right? It's not something you do. 
Like it's, it's, there's a different risk profile with my generators not producing all the watts or my generators not on <laughs> and I can I can go and plug my phone into the wall, yeah. right? Th then I'm in the air a, 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 a thousand feet and uh, I have no engine, right? So they must be pretty confident that it's going to work in it. In a... they're, they're amazingly stable systems. Right, okay. Unbelievably stable. Whatever you've built, it does what it does and it really just does that. Okay, so and when it comes to things that are easier to implement this on, my, my dad had a bunch of tractors on our farm, and those things were like as old as, I mean, probably him, and they always seemed to work. He might have needed to put some easy start in the inlet, but uh, <laughs> they just didn't not work. I mean, even if they were sitting in the field for an extremely long time, they just worked because they the diesel, but... Um, uh, so the point is that you talked about the fact that these kind of two, three kilowatt generators you can buy for four, 500 euros on Amazon or whatever. Yeah. Uh, I'm not advertising Amazon, by the way, this is just, I've just put something out of the air. Um, you can get these generators, but you're saying that they have these standard sort of Honda engines, but you're saying that actually those are harder to deal with than a four stroke engine from a simple yes. old car. Yes. Yep. Resistance. So, so would you like to step in, uh, Don, and, and, and share your experience? Uh, uh, Hank, we can come back to you at any point, so raise your hand. I, I know Don wanted to say something, so Don, please share your experience. <laughs> yep. You, uh, you can hear me? Yep. Ah, nice, thanks. Okay, I got some, some questions. Um, my first question is about the bubbler. Uh, have you ever tried a multi-stage bubbler? Uh, I draw something out here. Uh, it's like, uh, don't know if you can see it. Yeah, there it is. Um, I was thinking about if you uh, fill the first chamber with water and you use the bubbler or the, or the ultrasonic bubbler there, uh, you can uh, get a second channel to go into a gasoline uh, container. And then the last one, you can fill it with something else like water to clean it or something. Have you ever tried something like this? Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't chain bubblers into one another. I'll normally bring them together into a Y junction and then send it to the engine. Okay. Yeah. And, rather, than, uh, rather than sending air up, up down down a line, I'll go mm -hmm. ultrasound tank with fog. Mm -hmm. on, so I've got water vapor on one side, and then I'll put a mini carburetor on the other and bring them in onto a Y junction. I think I've got a video on that. Uh, video is a. It was just a five minute funny thing I was doing one day, running an engine on vinegar. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it's a new bubbler. channel. Yeah, it's a bubbler with vinegar in it, and then the other side is a little carburetor picking up fuel out of a little tank. Um, so I set it up to run on the carburetor, gave it the right amount of air on the air management valve, sent in more air with now vinegar in it in the bottom, so I'm making my bitch uh, thinner, which should cause the engine to slow down. I'm already at full RPM. If you add more air, she's going to slow down. I open the bubbler and you hear it go and you open the air management valve and it goes rum, 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 and there's all this extra power let's go right there it is there's all this extra power and it's it's a tiny little bit of petrol coming off the carburetor just enough to get the engine to run and tick along but if you open the air management valve it stops it goes no it's too much air no there's no fuel for that and the bulk fuel is coming off the bubbler with the uh, with the vinegar in it and it's vinegar because it's an acidic fuel that gets things going and it's got all this extra atomic mass to it that isn't water and i was i was, didn't have any sugar otherwise i would probably put sugar in there <laughs> yeah that was a nice tip thanks i'm gonna try that <laughs> some sugar in there as well i like awesome. that awesome and it works really yeah. well it's like okay you could have that generator yeah you can idle it you can put your generator under no load let it idle and then you can put five six hundred watts of load on it and it will go <laughs> But that's okay. You open your your bubbler with your your not water, give it a little bit more air, and it will pick up under load, and it'll sit there, and it will sit there and do that all day because yeah. it's being fed from a carburetor, so it's it's petrol content is fixed and stable. It isn't flooding. It's not changing. It's not blowing out lightweight or anything else. And you've now got a bulk fuel coming in from the bubbler or an ultrasound tank or whatever else. That's it. good. I got another question for uh, uh, perhaps a closed loop system. 
Uh, I saw a video that um, was uh, presented earlier uh, about closed loop system that was from 10, 20 years ago, maybe. And uh, he said, I have to start it as an open system and then I can close it if it's running. Uh, I was thinking about that. Uh, if you change the base point of the vacuum, if you uh, put a vacuum generator on the bubbler, can you uh, start it automatically? Oh, he, he's, he's closed looping though. That's a, yeah. that's a different game. But what they've done in that video does actually work for the purpose of a demonstration of an unloaded engine. Okay. Right? It does run like that because it's so clean. It's not, it's not knocking itself out. If you take a normal engine, you'd be no oxygen in the exhaust and you're trying to pull it back to the beginning with all this unburned fuel and it rapidly stalled out. Um, but when I stuck a gas analyzer in there and ran one for three or four hours like that, um, it, it slowly builds up unburned fuel and you'll get a little bit of engine oil and other stuff in there. And eventually your, your pollution level in that gas stream does reach a point where it causes the reactor to shut down and then it rapidly stalls out mm. after like three or four hours. Could, could you not just have a point where you identify where that regularly occurs and then just do a mix, do, do a swap switch out? So there's a period of like closed <coughs> loop. Well, you basically have to have a breather. Mm -hmm. As long as it's got a breather point on it, so it isn't actually a physically locked shut closed loop, then it will, it will, because uh, it's out, it's, you have an intake stroke and an exhaust stroke and they're 180 degrees out of phase. That's why these single cylinder engines are a big learning curve. They're really worth working on because you will learn more working on that small single cylinder engine than you will on the bigger multi-cylinder engines. But a multi-cylinder now has a much higher frequency of pulse and you do invariably end up with a high pressure wave on the exhaust side coinciding with the intake stroke. Whereas with the generator, it went suck, blow, suck, blow. So it goes suck up through the exhaust side. That's now slowing down. It's finished, isn't it? It's done its suck and now it's going to do blows. So suddenly you get on the fuel side or vice versa, blowing onto the exhaust side and sucking onto the fuel. But they don't happen at the same time. They happen out of phase with each other. Yeah. Yeah. So you're suddenly you're trying to maintain a vacuum. So there's a continuous stream of gases on both sides of the reactor. So if you have a a bigger four-cylinder engine, you, you negate that issue. Now you've just got suck and blow. It's just happening continuously. Right? And so, uh, so that's a really good point. So it might be cheap to start with a, a small engine like a lawnmower engine, but it's just going to be a nightmare to get it working for anything useful. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. so um, we're actually discussing uh, because Alan is a bit of an expert with motorbikes uh, to create our motor, our pump for our experiment with a four-stroke motorbike engine, is that, is that right? That would be good, or the Harbour Freight do um, a V-twin. It's the Honda V-twin. It's the GX160 engine, but there's two of them bolted together at, uh, in a V configuration, which gives you a multi-cylinder engine that's cheap mm. and it's small. D and defi I'm, define cheap for people listening. <laughs> under a couple of hundred dollars for a new one. That 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 is relatively cheap for any experiment in our field. Really cheap. <laughs> buy, a brand, buy a brand new Harbour Freight twin cylinder Honda GX160 engine. Mm -hmm. It's the same reactor set as I've been building all along, but now you've got two cylinders. Okay. Uh, this was actually going to be my next project if I can get one in the UK. You can get them in America really easily, but they're a little bit difficult to get over here. So uh, obviously buying something new for a couple of hundred dollars, you've saved yourself probably $500 in cleaning time. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and you know, pulling your hair out and wondering why it's not working and all this. If your intention is to, I want to power my house community, something such and such and such, buy a generator unit that is 30% bigger or 40% bigger than anything you think you need because you'll never get your estimations right for a start. And then get a dirty great big engine that is 10 times bigger than you need to spin that generator. Buy something old and yep. cheap and simple and don't ask it to evolve high you know, performance. Don't, if the thing's rated to, I don't know, it's a so many thousand kilowatt car engine, <laughs> you know, 
and you ask it to do 30% of its rated performance. So that means all your valves are going to be tight shut. She's down at her low, her low range. Your vacuums are going to be really, really high. That's awesome. And you're not asking, you don't have to high, do high precision work, easing the last power out of this bloody engine to make it meet original performances. Just put a big engine and let it go with a pulley and then gear it to the generator and let the engine go at a reasonable speed. Find out what your reactor set likes to do. Because these little Hondas, that's your limitation with the generators. It, it's the generator's running speed. You can go a little bit faster or a little bit slower, but if you go too slow and put it under a lot of load, you'll blow the coils out and you burn the coils. And if you go too fast, you blow the bearings. So the generators and you're sitting there 2004, 2005, closing anything towards 3000 RPM and you've done the bearings. And from then on, it's gonna rattle and clatter and squeech as it's running. And I've blown quite a few doing that. But a geek reactor on those little engines, it likes six and a half thousand RPM. Oh, all suddenly settles down and runs once you open the throttle. Now, I don't suggest anybody does this because if you get this wrong, you will end up with engine parts going across the workshop at supersonic speeds. But my, my engines, I mean, it's only me and Paul that could do this, right? My engines, they top out at 14,000 RPM. Oh, shit. <laughs> That's my, cru my, my upper cruising speed. I will bury the throttle and leave it at 14,000 RPM. Sorry, are we talking about on load here? Are we just talking about free running? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I'll have a bit of, if you can put a bit of load on the end of it. I mean, I've bur burnt out the bearings on generators. I've gone 12,000 RPM with my generator and then put it under load so I can keep control of it because it's trying to do 16 or 18. And I know that even with geek gas, it will come apart about 16,000 RPM. Now those engines, they're used on the go-karts, they race tune them and do all this stuff to them so they can get away with six and a half thousand RPM without so, anything falling so, apart. So that, that, that's an issue. So we've got, we got a couple of people. Uh, one is saying that the engine you mentioned, he's just looked it up, it's costing about $999. Uh, so that's just- well, they've got more expensive. Josh Hen, and well, everything's a bit more expensive, but still in, in our field, that's not a, a super expensive- it's not so bad. It's not such an expand experiment. And if we can prove that a geek engine <coughs> categorically is, is producing vastly more efficiency than uh, the engine without the geek, or we can produce, prove it is uh, proving over unity, or it's pr uh, producing transmutation uh, and potentially uh, remediation. And of course, we've seen these reactors emit coherent matter traveling waves in someone else's experiment. And in, in that case, there will be dark mode coherent matter traveling waves. And in that case, we should be able to take a cesium-137 standardized check source, place it near a geek reactor in various zones, test the radioactivity in our scintillator beforehand, and taste the radioactivity in the scintillator afterwards. And so, and I would talk to you about, we, we spoke about this before, about there are certain modes where you can get it to throw out all this radiation and there are certain modes where you can't. Well, in the case where we want to deactivate uh, and re remediate nuclear waste, I would like to see maybe a secondary flow of material outside of the GEAT reactor where you had your waste. So it's never in the GEAT reactor and it's mm -hmm. continuously processed by the emission of strange radiation yeah. from, a, from a GEAT reactor running in this mode. So we can do that experimentation with, I would prefer preferentially lose Cobalt 60 because it has a very short half-life. Uh, and, and then we can take that Cobalt 60 standardized source see its activity, we can then put it next to the reactor in various positions when it's in this unstable mode uh, or mode that it maximizes the emission of strange radiation. Uh, and then then, then we, we can prove that it is doing the emission of strange radiation. If it's producing, doing the uh, emission of strange radiation, we there, therefore know it, it's doing coherent matter in the reactor. And we're a step closer to uh, showing that. So we've got another person here, he says, Okay, so we're saying let's go for a two two stroke at least. Okay, with this engine you're describing, he's saying what about getting an old Jaguar V12 from the scrapyard? That might cost less than a thousand dollars. Just yeah. the engine block. Yeah, that's it. Awesome. Well, whatever you want, go and get an engine that runs that's big. Right. If, if you're trying to generate power for your project, right. 
right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just get a dirty, great big old engine. The older I, I, I can see Hank's wife now in the back room going, "Oh no!" <laughs> yeah, you don't want something with a with an onboard supercomputer. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, you don't need all of that. Find something that's mechanically simple. You, you want something from the seventies that just was beautiful. <laughs> yeah, something you can get parts for. Something you can you can take apart with a socket set. On yeah, an yeah. afternoon, you know, with the manual, you can take it apart, wow. clean it, get bits, and put it back together. It's a durable, solid, reliable donor engine. Yeah. And then hang a reactor set on one side, hang a dirty, great big bubbler on it, put it together, play with it. If you get the field to kick in and work properly, and you actually start to break down fuel properly, just it's, that's a lot of work. That doesn't just happen. It's mm -hmm. not easy, right? Mm -hmm. At least you're only trying to achieve one third torque. <laughs> and now you're going to spin your 10 kVA generator and you're going to make power and that engine will last you forever because it's never screaming away trying to do anything crazy. It's just going to do it. It's going, it, it, it's doing the old Enfield 500. It's going pop, 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 yeah, pop, pop. That's, that's it. You know, <laughs> and you're going it, up it, a hill like that in the Indian mountains. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, but yeah. that's that's what you if you if you're trying to make power, that is the way to, to do it. Mm -hmm. you know? um, as soon as you buy an off-the-shelf generator and you try and build a geek system, you're trying to match this phase shifted gas flows together and then really, really fettle the system to get all the way up to full full torque at the lowest possible vacuum with the highest flow rates of air with the most volumes of fuel going in there. It's all working its ass off, and you've still got to get all of that fuel into a clean vapor and get it round the rod. So I've got another guy here, Alex de Castillo. He's saying 350 Chevy in the US are cheap and ubiquitous. There you go. So a cl classic one for them. Uh, I mean, these are things that are designed to use basically fuel because it's practically free, right? So <laughs> we're not in that world anymore. This is, so this is the work that Paul had. That's what that was the sort of engine that Paul was working on. <laughs> right. And he said, "Oh, this isn't difficult. This is easy." And he's just putting things on there, and it's working every time. I'm like, I'm standing there with this little tiny generator, scratching my head, going, "This doesn't fucking work." Okay, so uh, I've got two questions uh, that people are really wanting to uh, have answers to that we get a lot of questions for. So you mentioned earlier that the simple rubbish uh, free plans ha had a long rod that had three welding spots to locate it in the center of the chamber. What is the kind of way around that? And it, it, is, it, is it different for a horizontal reactor and a vertical reactor? It's exactly the same. Okay. Um, You've got a vertical reactor, you've got your little T at the bottom where your fuel's coming in and your fuel pipe with your body in it. So you unscrew the little lug on the bottom and then you put in a little retaining wire, non-ferrous retaining wire. Non-ferrous, so this would be a stainless steel pin, let's say. Uh, brass, I normally use brass. Or like so a that, that side it's like cold. A brazing rod or something, something yeah. small that, it's just slipped up inside. They're like, you know, yay length. They've got a little round at the bottom, so it sits nicely in the bottom of the reactor, and there's a little round bit at the top that holds the tip of the rod. And you just pop it up inside. You don't want to push it all the way up into the reactor and try and hold it in place it uh -huh. in the way. You just it's, If they're sitting in the bottom of the T and they've dropped out the reactor and in the bottom of their T and their fuel in there is here, well, it's very difficult to suck it up and into the reactor. So you just pick it up and get it up into the into the pipe basically so, so you're getting it into the free flowing area and that's that pin would be sitting let's say you'd have a flat or a little a little uh, notch cut in the end of the bullet shape on on no, the front no. end no I, I i make a little i have my my pin and it has a little little circle okay all right so and the rod just you know you pop the rod up in there you just catch the tip with the thing you push it up as long as it doesn't slip down the side and get mm -hmm. jammed yeah, that's what yeah. you're looking out for. You just wanted to hold the end up in place, yeah. and it basically gets out of the way. You don't and want so, it. So, so when it's running vertically, it just lifts up under it. Just its... goes, it just, just, yeah. just, it's just enough of a lift to make sure that as you start the thing, the rod actually picks up and goes up. Right. So you don't want it. You don't want it sitting there the whole time, obviously. No. 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 Okay. So, so I've got Jean Manning here, and she's saying, "Thank you for joining us, Jean." Uh, she's saying, "When the floating rod is taken out of the geek system." Does the rod radiate strange radiation? Paul Pantone slapped a rod on a table in front of me and my digital camera ceased to operate after that. 
Afterwards, a healer in the room offered to fix the camera, and he did. <laughs> uh, yes, I remember those stories, and it's great that we've got somebody on board that um, was actually there for that. Um, my rods have never done any of that. And I, had, I did have the chance of seeing a reactor set in Germany that was setting off all of the like, bells and whistles on all the equipment. Um, and I pulled the rods out, put them through my imaging system, did all kinds of stuff with it. And they, their magnetic fields were exactly the same as mine. And I never cooked any electronics or anything with the rod. Um, you know, and these have been in and out of my rucksack with my laptop and my hard drive and flown around the world. At first, I was like, I should put this somewhere out of the way. Like, well, I never did it. Mm -hmm. I never had that problem. But then no, I, don't, I, mean, I don't build reactors with the, you I know, mean, I, I figured out what was causing all these strange other effects. And I yeah, so, so I mean, don't do that. Yeah, so so I've had this conversation with Dan, uh, Gene, just just for the record here, where I talked about these issues of this radiation coming out, where you've seen these videos with the coherent matter traveling waves, as I call them, coming out of the reactor, and uh, and also you, you you tune it so it's below the ball lightning phase. It's more like just like a, a a light ring around the tail end of the rod. And so I don't think he's getting too much coherent matter in there. I don't think in that case he would get the, the build up and the emissions in this case, but we would like to do that. So <laughs> okay. do this because, deliberately and carefully yeah. and under control. Yes, so so uh, we, we understand more now how to shield for this radiation. Dilution is the solution to pollution with things like this. You would keep it at a distance, but this is the, the to, to be able to control production on a contin continual flux of this radiation, you can do it with a cavitator, but the cavitator is con co condensing the clusters from the environment, and then they blow up. And after a while, Shishkin found that the, the cavitator didn't produce strange radiation, and he had to physically move it to another part of his lab. And I've spoken about this a number of times. But in, in your case, you may actually be creating the clusters as well as aggregating them and then blowing them up again in this unstable mode. And that might be what we need in order to remediate uh, nuclear uh, radionuclear. So, Gene, I, I think what, what he's saying, Dan was saying, is that you can avoid uh, producing these activated rods. But what I can say from the field in general, um, we've been able to reactivate um the uh, emission of uh, uh, the Lion guy uh, who developed this uh, uh, reactor series, the Lion reactors, he was able to um, do it nine months after just by heating it up to about a thousand degrees and reactivate the clusters that are in there. And then I told this in 2018 to the, um, the Russian community and they came back and said, well, we've been able to do this 18 months later. There, it was a bit of a pissing contest. <laughs> and, and, and then, when the Bogdanovich paper came out that uh, and they were showing these things lasting for two days, uh, there was this person in, in um, America on classified work, but it doesn't matter. They said that they were able to get these things to come out many, many months later. So, and, and Ken Shoulders said these things last indefinitely. So they may actually be dormant in the reactor, but you might need to re-energize them, or it might just be that you've never got them to the stage where they're they're in there to a, to a high degree, uh, Dan. So, and that might be just yeah, that's 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 kind of what I'm thinking is it's it's se separated it out from the different functionalities of it. It's like what do you want it to do? Do you want it to run an engine, or do you want it to create ball lightning and other things? And we don't want other things when you're trying to run your house. The last thing you need is to have a piece of equipment that's sitting out in the shed in the community that every now and then throws some random wobbly and opens a temporal anomaly in the shed and eats all your chickens. I mean, it's just, and that. <laughs> that's the kind of thing I would expect it to do, actually. <laughs> the, guy, the guy down in Germany, he, he said one day, Paul said, if it starts to wobble and space goes a bit wibbly, he said, don't touch it. <laughs> He repeated that to me several times because he knows me, and I'm like, oh. So, so actually, that's, somebody that's in Germany went, oh my lord, space and time distortion. It's all going wobbly. I think I'll film it. And he got out his lovely new iPhone with a really high quality camera on it, put it out, started filming it, reached out, stuck it into the field, and woke 
up an hour later on the far side of the workshop and the phone had a big white streak all the way through it where it arced out through the phone, electrocuted him and taken him across the yard. All right, that, okay, so this is another safety issue. And of course, so Gene, I don't know what type of camera that was at the time, but um, <coughs> I know batteries have an issue. You, you said actually, Dan, earlier to me today, that, that you had several phones that you were filming with and it, they failed, but how did they fail? The batteries died. They rapidly started losing charge every time I went near the workshop. I had a fully charged phone, put it in flight mode, walk in the workshop, and you'd lose the battery in minutes sometimes. It just eat the power out of the battery, and then they wouldn't take a charge properly. Um, luckily, we were doing a lot of festival work, building all the big stages. So at the end of every festival, there's always a box of lost mobile phones. <laughs> <laughs> so the university used to provide me with another mobile phone. And I'd go in the workshop, and six weeks later, it'd be dead. I'd go and put, build the next major stage and be issued with another mobile phone. It's like, I eventually don't, don't take your nice one in the workshop. So, so I, I <laughs> we, we know that these, these, this emissions can go into materials and they get bound to magnetic and paramagnetic materials. And lithium is a paramagnetic element. And uh, so it is quite likely that the, the, the clusters may be binding into there and messing with the chemistry in some way. Um, uh, uh, or it, it might be that they're, they're causing some bridges between the, the membranes in there. So oh, failing in that respect. Something yeah, is so. definitely happening to those poor batteries. So what you're saying is we need a shielded camera that's hardwired, like, like a webcam. Best, best to use webcam. I tried webcams. The, the webcam wire acts as an aerial. I had a lovely one set up in, in Holland um, in a big workshop. I pulled on the phone to proudly show him my engine that was working really nicely. And every time I started the engine, the um, webcam had picked up so much noise, it distorted the call and cut out the call. If I unplugged the webcam, it worked. That was fine. You could have the call and Paul could see from the camera on the, on the laptop, but I couldn't get the laptop close enough to the reactor to film it. So after a few attempts, we gave up because the, yeah, the wire on the webcam acts as an aerial. So, so I can give a tip, tip for that. You, you, can, you can get these uh, USB isolators. They're not good for uh, USB 3, so they won't do necessarily high definition webcams, but they will prevent the, the charge and, and, and grounding issues that you get through and protect your, your computer equipment. So I've got another question here on the grounding issue uh, from uh, Peter. And uh, I know there's something you want to talk about when we go uh, off the, the bounce stream to YouTube, uh, which will be published later, but you want to get it out the door in, yeah, in just, your... Just because we, we've got a plan for releasing some stuff. Yes, I, I, I appreciate that. So so they're saying, so so say what you can to this point. Question for Dan, you've made mention several, several times to current flow and conductivity in the device. I believe, I believe Pantone said in one of his videos, one needed to ground the reactor, otherwise it might draw unnecessary attention, possibly related to EM fields. If the whole system is electrically connected, it is sufficiently necessary to ground any aspect of the system, or should one connect specific parts to the ground? What do you think is building up when the system is not grounded? When it's not grounded, noise. Okay. It's just, it's full. It's, it's filling up. You get electrical charges bouncing around. The things are going to start to fill up, basically. Um, you're going to get a lock. Uh, they like to be on the floor. Paul always ran his own S generators, his engines, on the floor. Um, I, I run mine on a workbench because I like to stand up in front of the workbench without getting a bad back for hours, controlling my valves and looking at my equipment. Um, his brother used to do the same thing. And occasionally they'd get an engine that just wouldn't work. And then they put it, Paul would come along and he'd have a go, he'd switch it off, pick it up, put it on the floor. He'd start it, it would run. Because, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's your own error. You, you, you haven't set the controls right. So his brother would switch it off, pick it up, put it on the workbench, pull it over and it wouldn't run. The engine might start, but the reactors wouldn't run or it wouldn't kick in at all. It wasn't until they picked up one that wasn't working on the workbench and put it on the floor and suddenly it all kicked in. Then the reactors would run and all the emissions cleaned up. They like to be not only electrically grounded, at which point you just want to take a wire off of the standard earthing point on the generator. They're normally bolted to the bottom of the engine 
where the engine mounts are onto the frame. That's where you hook your earth wire when you want to ground down your generator normally. Mm -hmm. So you hook a wire on there and stick a pin in the ground. That gets you an electrical connection to the ground. But sometimes they actually like to sit on the floor and then the fields off the bottom of the reactor are now directly into the floor. Um, and I think Paul said the one that is the one with his brother, they worked out eventually, it wasn't that it wasn't on the ground, it was underneath a strip light with a dodgy starter. And okay. the dodgy starter was directly over the reactor. And there was probably a steel workbench involved. So they've got electrical insulation and Faraday cage effect going on underneath it on a concrete floor that will be a steel reinforced concrete floor. And right over them was this source of high frequency noise. And it was interfering with the reactor and wasn't allowing it to work. And as soon as they moved it off that spot, took it away from the light and put it down on the ground, it would kick in. So yeah, grounding, just earth the thing out as you would normally, and if at all possible, put it on the floor. Okay, thank you. So I've got Josh uh, Hannon, uh, and I, I, we've published something that was available on an uh, engineering forum or uh, uh, over Unity forum, where they're talking about three different rod lengths and three different chamber sizes for different typical fuels. Um, but he's got a more gen general question along this line. It says, are there any formulas to engineer the size of the reactor based upon engine displacement and fuels used? Uh, uh, I mean, you described the fact that you've basically got three three different ones anyway. I guess that's the same one that we've all seen. Is, yeah. is, is there any other specifics? You, there, is, there is a mathematical equation that's based off of engine size and piston bore, and it tells you the optimum rod diameter and then you design your reactor accordingly. But unless you're going to machine from a bar of steel, an actual tube, unless you're going to go out and buy a gun barrel drill bit and drill through yay length of steel all the way perfectly through the center and then machine that out inside and then turn down the outside and profile it and thread it, which I did do. Um, but you're asking, it's just an epic amount of work for no real game yeah i i actually no i i i agree I, with this. I mean i i've got a family we uh four often we have guests maybe um as many as four guests in the house uh, in addition to us four we literally have only 15 amps coming into the house uh at 220 volts so that's that's the power we've got coming in uh maximally to the whole house and then we are we have uh, a three kilowatt maximum continuous burn central heating, which boosts to twenty four kilowatts uh, mm -hmm. when you are doing um, uh, you know a shower or something hot water. Now that that could be going into an electrical system, so it's quite easy to quantify that people could get away with maybe uh, three kilowatts of um, electrical power to a house uh, and and you know on a on a sort of base load and maybe three to five kilowatts in in gas or whatever so you, you could you could quite easily say what a family would would require and then let's say let's get a generator to match that if we're going to go all electric in terms yeah. of the actual appliances yeah, if you if you picked up a got a one inch reactor it's got the out one inch outer case a half inch in a fuel pipe those reactors are, will run between a 250 and one liter engine mm -hmm. So as soon as you're up, if you're on the GX 160s, these little two KVAs, they're a little bit small for that reactor. So I go down a reactor size, but that slightly smaller reactor, Paul built those for 79 cc engines. So the 125 is sitting in this crossover. You're either driving the small reactor to its limit of getting fuel through it in order to get to full power or you're putting a one inch reactor on there and you're driving it at the absolute minimum volume mm. of fuel going through it. And it's, it's kind of sits in this gray zone between the two, which is unfortunate because it's the one everybody grabs. So if you go to a, the next size up, if you go to a 3.5 or 3.8 KVA generator, they've then got the GX220 engine. It's the same engine block, it's just got a longer throw on the piston. To give it more cc well that's now a 250 cc engine so you can put a one inch reactor on it and everything from there 
up to about a 10 kVA generator will all run on the one inch reactor. That's, they're, they're nice for it. Um, so if you wanted, if I was specking out uh, an off-grid power system for a decent sized house, I'd have a 5 kVA generator. They don't actually make 5 kVA in, in the real world. There's always a power factor involved on generators. So they'll make 80% of their official rated load. They'll do that at full voltage. After that, they will start to lose power. So this is when you get a new generator, the first thing you do is run it as factory standard and you do a load test. Mm -hmm. and you do a minimum six point load test. No load, 500 watts, 1000 watts, 1500, so on. You do six tests across the span of what it, should, what it will give out. Then you look at fuel consumption, emissions, engine temperature, and voltage, output voltage. And you'll find that they go, yes, we're making 240 volts, 220 volts all the way along. And at some point they go like that and they start to lose voltage. And it's normally at about two thirds of the rated load, you start to see this voltage drop off. Right? What everybody does is they go and they adjust their fuel screw and they wind it open or they adjust the grub on the arm, they wind it open and they get full output current. But you, you blow your engines doing that. They don't last very long when you do that. You go out on a, you go out on a, on a site and you run a, an engine at full chat every day for a week. By the end of the week, you're buying a new generator. You, you talk, we're talking about power generation here and there was some talk earlier and in various videos that I've seen of wrapping a coil around the outside of the geek reactor. There's a flux, let's say, of, of something going into the reactor or coming out, whatever. There's a differential there. There's some magnetohydrodynamics going on in there. The people have observed some power. Uh, unfortunately, in the videos that I've seen, they were using a clamp on uh, meter, ammeter, and uh, obviously the people that were impressed by what they were seeing did not know that he wasn't using the ammeter correctly because he actually wasn't closing the loop. <laughs> so yeah. I just thought, oh my God, rookie error here. Um, so I've not seen a video where this has actually been demonstrated other, by, other than by incorrectly using the equipment. So uh, have you seen it correctly demonstrated where there is actual amps? Uh, I, have, I and, have put an amp meter around the geek gas line on an engine and seen 50 amps going down that geek gas line. Okay. And have you ever tried to use that to drive a load? Not yet, no. no. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was 2016. I got to that point and then I had the... Th my third nervous breakdown of trying to deal with other people okay and um i went you know what i'm not i'm not sitting in this workshop anymore i've been in here for three years straight i haven't seen or anything been anywhere done anything at all and i'm having another nervous breakdown yeah, yeah, and yeah. we were getting death threats it was yeah. getting dangerous i i did one and went and sat up on a mountain in morocco um, out of the way where I have friends and contacts where I can literally sit on the top of the mountain and see them coming because you yeah. stand with a sore thumb. Um, and I put out a little video with, uh, the, with the lovely people from QEG. Yeah. Right. Stopped off to see them on the way through Mar Marrakesh, made a little video, said hi, and wandered off the mountain. What do we get? 15 minute public death threat from some psychopaths. Right who took that video and then cut it up and re-edited it. We're coming for you. This is it. The great fight is on. And it was a 15 minute public death threat. Like, okay, we've rocked the boat a little bit too much. <laughs> I have posted some videos I knew I wasn't supposed to put. <laughs> and we've, we've been speaking to people in various companies and places and have rocked the boat and they've had enough. Well, from, from my <laughs> point of view, people are already coming to get every citizen in Europe right now because our, my gas bill has gone from not a lot of money to uh, half of my disposable income Shocking, just for the gas. Shocking. So like, they're already at the door uh, yeah. taking yeah. food out of my mouth. So There was another factor. Yeah. To me, at the end of days, there will be a pole shift or some realignment of Earth's magnetic and electrical fields. When this happens, the geek reactors will stop working because they, they're interacting with that field. And Sorry, I'd working. understand if it turns off, but surely if it's just shifting, you just need to rotate the reactor. 
Um, <laughs> no, they're, they're vertical, but they don't. He said they will. They will stop working, and you will get all kinds of weird things. And they so, won't. so, so, was he around when this last happened? No, this is, he said this is something that would happen every so many hundred thousand years. It coincides. Okay, with this is interesting because it, it shows a consciousness deep, shifts and this, this kind of this, thing. This shows a deep level of understanding about some aspect of the reactor's function. What is yeah. it? They, 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 they're not a standalone unit. They don't sit there in isolation being a reactor. They are engaged with the wider fields of the planet. Okay, but, but no, I, we can I, all worry about the sky this, falling in, can't we? We started having this little problem with them in, in 2016. Okay. Um, that they would run in the morning and not run in the afternoon. Right? Okay. Now, I, would, this, I was pulling my hair out on this because I was in Japan with the Japanese dealerships trying to go and present to Honda their engine with this thing on it that's working beautifully. And I get to Japan and I put one together and it won't work. It doesn't make any sense what's going on here. Eventually, I worked out the Japanese pipe is no good for a deep reactor. Ah, so this is a, a, a ah, material gotcha. thing. Japanese pipe wouldn't bloody work. But I Why? Had Why? And I, it's an alloy. It's probably because they're in a high earthquake zone and they've got some special alloy that we don't use as pipe. And their alloy is inappropriate for the task at hand. Now, okay. I had a Paul Pantone original reactor in that same workshop. I took his reactor off of, the, off of the broken engine, cleaned it, put it on mine, and it worked. Great, I think. It's working. So I ran the engine in the morning. It works. And my emissions say 18, 19, 20% oxygen. If I run it in the afternoon, it says 14% oxygen, and it won't do any better. Mm -hmm. If I take it apart, oh, I must have a leak. And I, for like two weeks, I'm ripping this thing apart, putting it back together again, reconfiguring stuff, doing diagnostic checks, trying to work out what's going on. And then I went, right, advice from Paul. What have you forgotten? Don't just do one run. Run it. Let it run. Shut it down. Start it up. Run it. Run it all day. Wait to see what happens. Run it tomorrow and the day after. And don't change anything. Just keep running it and watch what happens. Because weird things can creep in. So it would run in the morning and it would shut down at lunchtime. At the same time, there was some crazy anomaly where a super sun fell into the center of our galaxy and sent out some huge, great shockwave. And all over the world, scientific labs were reporting transmutation of elements and alterations to DNA that was in storage and kind of weird things happening in other respectable scientific labs around the world. As we turned around, the planet turned. In the afternoon, we were facing into this oncoming wave. And it was disrupting the Earth's magnetosphere. So as I was facing into the wave, it was shutting down the reactor. And then I went around the other side of the planet. We got to evening time. We went around the back of the planet, behind the wave, she would work. But it would only run between midnight and 11 o'clock. And after When you say only run, are we talking it re returned to a normal uh, petrol generator's efficiency? Because like... It would, like it would run as a geek reactor. It would run as a geek reactor. So I'd right. have the emissions that say it's running as a geek reactor in the morning but then in the afternoon it would have the emission profile of a vaporizing carburetor well i mean if that's still better then it's still better i mean everyone recognizes that if you take an electric car and you run it in the tundra you, you no, might the, have the, you the might lose 30 40 percent of your mileage we went into this period of time where they won't run right period so but won't even run like well, you won't... The engine will run, but the reactor will not run as a geek reactor. So in 2019, okay. I took a system that's the ones that's on the videos, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is 2014, 2015, works beautifully on the first videos, got all the emissions control and everything. Took the same system, put it in a workshop in Germany in 2019, and all year I worked on that thing and built six different reactors and reconfigured everything, new carburetors, new air management valves, a whole thing. Not once did it make a reversing field. Not mm. once. And it would not run, period. The engine would run, but the reactor would not run in 2019. It was doing that in 2020, and it was the end of last year that David said, oh, I've got reversing field. We've come out of the end of this wave, which Paul had told me, during the end of days, when there's the great upheaval, what we're all in now, Paul was quite aware of what's going to happen, so it was quite a lot of us. Um, you will come a point where the Earth's ma magnetic field or electrical field is going to be going through a major shift and they won't run. 
when that happens, put geek down, go and do other stuff and come back to it in the right moment. So from 2016 till now, I've had one but, person contact me about plans. Okay. Last two months ago, I started thinking, oh, maybe this summer I will put a new system together. Then I have a conversation with David who has quite synchronistically and all by himself decided we're going to restart with all the geek stuff. I have a conversation with David about that and the next day I get messages from you guys and every day for the last two weeks, somebody had contacted me going, I spoke to you two years about plans. Would you do this? Can you do that? How do we get a class? It's like the whole collective has suddenly gone, geek, must be geek time. <laughs> it, it might have been what they were referring to with the chill bolted observatory when they when they had the crop circle and they were saying the, the window is closing right <laughs> when they, they gave a warning and they said that windows and it might have just been that there was a period of time in which there was the right flux which was not good for geet <laughs> or it was yes. good for geet yeah it was doing what it was okay. necessary for, for planetary consciousness shifts and other <laughs> yeah, things. yeah right not yeah. any good for running with a geek reactor so i went off and did Ormus. Soil restoration, uh, developed various other like products for with my herbalist friends. We went and learned how to make the desert green again. And Fantastic. Other other exciting things. Other exciting things. Okay, so has anyone got any questions uh, on YouTube that they want to ask? I'm going to look, quickly look through what they've got there. Does anyone else want to put their hand up? Uh, Peter, did you want to ask anything? Peter Lindquist, did you want to ask anything? Uh, no. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, I'm fine. Uh, most of the questions uh, have been touched on. Uh, I, I think the uh, uh, reliability and, uh, shall we say, uh, the uh, uh, the need to operate this uh, device continuously uh, uh, needs uh, to be uh, uh, understood. Um, what uh, Dan has said uh, most recently is rather disturbing from uh, from an energy producing perspective. I, I I agree. I mean, I'm I'm happy if it if it defaults back to standard internal combustion engine efficiency, but if it just doesn't work <laughs> at all, that's that's a different issue. Um, but I I can imagine that at least it would do a vaporizing carburetor type uh, operation, which is still better than an an ordinary ordinary ice. But you're just not going to get the geek gas. So yeah, so there needs to be a better handle on that to make it a technology rather than a mystery. Uh, um, but having said that, this is true also of, uh, for instance, um, seed germination studies. Uh, they only found that you got the tran transmutation between the potassium and calcium in certain phases of the moon. And that's because of the gravitational lensing of relic neutrinos. And so it may be some similar effect going on but uh, and like I say, it, 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 if it produces strange radiation, we know it's either grabbing these things or synthesizing them in the same way that the cavitator of Shishkin was doing. And Shishkin found, you, unless you're out, maybe it's different if you're outside, but if you're not outside, certainly he was in a room, you had to physically move this thing for it to start producing a flux again. It might still do something useful within the cavitator, but it's not building them up to such a level that they de uh, get unstable and, and shoot off. The, the strange radiation. So um, these are these are the things that we can work out. But we our understanding is so much further down the line in terms of parts of the components of what may be going on, and we can verify what is in and what is out by um, by doing the tests with the cobalt sixty, doing the tests with the ga gas process analysis. We we can see if it's just plainly a more efficient engine or whether it's it's something more interesting going on, but. I think uh, Dan has, he, Dan, you spoke about some universities that did some analysis of the gas themselves and they found some interesting things. Could you talk a bit about that? Um, yeah, this would have been Paul stuff. They, they analyzed the gas and um, they found helium, tritium, deuterium and hydrogen oh. and no carbon. Oh. That, was, that was their report. But they've only been able to do one set of tests. You know, we need repeatable data. Yeah. Um, and they were putting, Paul was running that on petrol. So there's carbon going in and there was no carbon in the geek gas at all. Nothing. And they've only got hydrogen and helium and things between the two. Now, as you tweak your rod length, 
by fractions. Now, by the way, there's not a lot of things between hydrogen and helium. There's <laughs> not a lot. There are things. There are things between the two. There are things between the two. And it's when you get things between the two that you get magic happening. Yeah. You know, if you just take hydrogen. Oh, no, no, no. Sorry. Sorry. The magic happens and that creates the things between the two. Exactly. <laughs> yes. You know you've got the magic happening when you've got... Uh, on, on, on the plus on the plus side, if it produces things between hydrogen and helium, you you are producing the things that uh, hot fusion wants. So uh, the the worst case scenario of this is our waste is someone else's treasure. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't this. You can imagine this on a on a on a, another level up there somewhere. So imagine if you're an archangel and you have inspired someone to build this thing, and you get your your quarterly review. <laughs> You're so good. It's like, what did, what did you show them to build this time? Oh, I showed you to build one of these. It's like, what, you've taken the fuel injector, you've taken the plasma injector off of somebody's spaceship and convinced them to stick it on the side of an engine. <laughs> <laughs> you've, done, you've done what I mean, try to explain that in, in your angelic quarterly review. <laughs> They're not supposed to be running engines. This is for us to learn about transmutation of matter and controlling it complex fields and other types of radiation and stuff and we're, we're just using an engine as a convenient pump that's what an engine is it's not an engine it's a pump it sucks on one side and blows on the other it's a pump that happens to do some other mechanical work yeah <laughs> for me the interesting part about this is it's it, it may not be as lethal as a cavitator uh, uh, for producing strange radiation and so that gives us opportunities to manipulate matter that, in the one sense, as we just talked about, may produce a fuel for a different type of, te type of technology where there is a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> and secondly, it may be able to fix the other major non-solar derived energy source that we have on planet Earth, which is fission. So uh, either way, we're dealing with uh, nu nuclear energy, uh, either fixing one's problems or actually fixing the other's problems <laughs> which is not having the fuel um so so I, I i'm happy with those kind of outcomes they, they both of those outcomes either or would be fantastic the rest of it if if we can get it to run stably and produce more efficiency that's that's fantastic too the, <clears throat> there, <clears throat> there's one other uh, aspect uh, which i have seen uh, i can't remember exactly where but uh, I've, I think I saw either pictures or a short video of the um, uh, vortexes, vortices at the inlet and the exit uh, of the uh, gate pipe. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, I think uh, uh, photographing those by simply putting a uh, uh, a piece of glass in, in uh, replacing part of the tube with a glass uh, together with uh, analysis of the gas would probably be uh, uh, providing a great deal of insight as to what is actually happening. Oh, absolutely. Especially if we looked at the color of the, the discharges. And uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, most of us who, who follow this. Uh, 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 strange uh, field uh, are looking for a process which is uh, continuous and, and I think uh, this process has some interesting characteristics it is um, uh, it is a low temperature uh, it is not particularly dense in uh, in the energy that it produces, as far as we can tell. <coughs> so it would be potentially a very good source for long-term production of energy, if we can control the, please call it the GEET process. When, when it's running, it's incredibly stable. It, it doesn't matter whether it's in vaporizing carburetor mode or in, in GEET mode. Like you, you literally you set the control valve to a position and the engine just runs and it doesn't miss a beat it doesn't rev up it doesn't rev down it doesn't do anything it's so unbelievably stable 
So if you want to take a continuous measurements, and there's no reason why you, you can't, you can drive two engines off of one reactor, or you can have a, a pump, and, and you can connect that in line so the reactor is split, it comes to the pump and to the engine. You can open a pump and you can push gas off to the side and you can run a burner with it and have the engine running and the burner running and have everything totally stable and set. And if you don't move a valve, nothing changes. So now you have a continuous output of gas, which you can run through equipment and do the analysis with. You don't have to draw a bit off and then send it into the machine. You can have a continual stream of gas passing through a device that you can then take a reading on as to what the gas is. And then you can open and close valves and change settings on the fly and see how that causes the reactor to kick in and kick out and have a, a continuous output. And then if you have some kind of filtration system that splits your, collects your helium and your hydrogen, then you can rarefy down that gas as a constant process and output whichever, whichever element you want. Okay, yeah, so um, I've got a question here about, um, I, I spoke to, to you about this earlier today and I didn't think you were very familiar. I don't know whether you had any time this afternoon to have a look at it, but this um, claims by this group called the Strike Foundation and a, a, a chap called Malcolm Bendel uh, out of, um, uh, just off the coast, the, the islands of God, the Maldives. Um, and it, it, it appears to be a gate. Um, did you have a chance to look into it? If not, then then no, maybe we'd, we'd take another time, session when you've done that. <coughs> no, I didn't get a chance to have a look at that today. Okay, all right. So that, that's a no, uh, Josh. Um, uh, and I have someone here. What about using a small engine as a servant unit for a larger engine? Yes. Yes, so that's by Tex. Tex has asked that question. Yeah. Thanks, if, Tex. You, if you've got a small engine that runs really nicely with a reasonable size reactor on it and some, some fuel delivery, you can have one small engine running a reactor and then you can push the gas off the side to another engine. Right. Okay. It's how, it's how Paul used to start with a car or a bigger engine. He would slave a bigger engine to the heat reactor and then see how the car behaved and what kind of amounts of fuel it was going to need and what its characteristics would be. And he'd often find that in that moment, um, the geek gas would clean the carbon out of the engine and it would all blow out the back of the car. Okay. Um, so yeah, they always used to, every time they had a car, they'd slave it across. So you can, you can do the same thing to a burner and you can have your generator running, producing some electrical power. And then because they want to go faster, the reactors want a higher impulse they want more suck if you've got a little pump on the side that's pumping off to a burner then you can apply that extra vacuum and use the fuel so you can have heating and power at the same time and they they'll like that you just mustn't compress the fuel too much okay that's interesting because i've got a question here from eric and he says dan possible is it possible to bottle up geek gas to burn in a stove or heat house very dangerous very dangerous it has a self-ignition pressure i can't remember what it is but it's lower than petrol so i th think somebody said 1.4 bar or 1.5 bar they they tried to put geek gas into a bottle and at a certain point the pump exploded so this would explain how engines when they're in the proper geek gas mode don't need a uh, spark plug yeah they diesel they right. run like a diesel they go under yeah. compression Okay, so the answer there, sorry, uh, Eric, is no. <laughs> don't, don't bottle it. <laughs> don't, don't try it's and bottle it. It's demand system. It's like HHO. You don't make HHO and bottle it. It's bloody dangerous. But that's the interesting thing about uh, Amaz's gas. You can bottle it, and he bottled it for 10 years. And he did three and a number of other years. There was no hydrogen embrittlement of the, D, of the, the, the chamber. So it... it it, the molecules are, or whatever they are, the clusters are big enough and he compressed it to a liquid. And in oh. fact, when you decompress it from a liquid, it still uh, acts as the gas. That's really cool. Yeah, that, that, is, that is really cool. So if we can get a geek generator to generate uh, un unlimited amounts of uh, Amaza gas, then we're onto a winner <laughs> and compress it. It would, it would depend on what your gas composition is. It, it, yeah. Isn't it? yeah. You know, if you could you know, micro tune the thing to have a, a gas composition that's safe to put under compression and bottle, then 
great, but I don't recommend anybody sticks. Yeah, so so let, try let's not try and make problems. <laughs> no, try. that will that will blow up. And the other thing that will definitely cause you problems is if you blend HHO and geek gas. So the, uh, yeah, that's really okay. Dangerous. Really Have dangerous. you tried? Do you know there's anyone that's tried that? Um, Paul didn't try it. He knew it would be dangerous. Somebody okay. came along and said they had, and he bought a car. I said, look, I've got a geek system with a HHO cell and it works. And he started up and ran it. We turned on his HHO cell and it started sending gas into the engine. And all of a sudden there was a really big bang and the engine stalled out. He thought that was funny. So he did it again. And on the third time, the whole front end of the engine came off. It went through the front of the car, took out the radiator, the front of the car and buried itself in the wall on the other side of the yard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ripped it to pieces. <laughs> Uh, I've tried battery acid and aluminium, um, which is another one of Paul's favourites, which makes hydrogen gas. Yes, yes, yes. Um, when you pull over one of those little engines, there's a moment where the waste spark coincides with the cylinder crossflow little valve bump that they have at the end. Mm -hmm. It basically it opens its inlet as it fires the spark plug. Okay. Hold on, baby. Oh, yeah, that's how I blew up the HHO rigs last year. You pull the generator over, and because it's going quite slowly, you end up with a flash coming backwards out of the air intake and then down through your HHO line, which ah, causes not good. <laughs> yeah, so, no, not good. Yeah, so on, so, on this auto ignition <laughs> uh, uh, question, we've got WP for Truth. He's asking on YouTube would, would uh, using a diesel motor be a good idea? Great, but you don't have a spark plug to get it to initially kick in yeah so, so essentially you're using a petrol engine and then at the point at which it becomes not necessary to use a spark <coughs> plug then you don't need to use a spark plug because yeah. I, I heard paul describing how the engine was running and then you know they wanted to shut it down so someone went and pulled out the spark plugs and it continued to run <laughs> yeah they'd been somebody had been fiddling well, one of the demonstrations somebody had been fiddling with the the, the timing by turning the um, distributor cap and they'd been playing around and hadn't found a setting that made any difference. And they'd forgotten to do the bolt up and they just left it floating. Mm -hmm. And uh, somebody came, this is the same time they did the how, how slow will the engine go thing. Right. Going, chunk, 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 chunk. And then you open the valves and it revs like a wailing banshee. And the, the uh, distributor cap was just like twitching about <laughs> on the top of the engine because <laughs> it had nothing to do with it anymore. But that's once the engine is running and it's on geek gas. Yeah, you know, beforehand, very, very difficult. Okay, so has anyone got any uh, questions that they want to raise their hand for in the Zoom chat? Uh, if people want to think about that, um, uh, otherwise, I'm going to try and see if we can pull out any questions that have not been addressed in the remote view question uh, comments. So, is anyone? Oh, so we've got someone raising their hand. Who is that raising their hand? We've got Chris. Okay. Chris, actually, uh, is this the Chris from Australia who's done the simulation? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Oh well. Firstly, thank you very much. Really appreciate taking on that that kind of side of things. I think you were already doing something similar along the, that those lines with regard regards to the toroidal moment. So actually, it'd be great if you could describe your experience, what you found so far, and if if you've got any questions, please ask them to Dan because uh, maybe that will inspire your further simulation work. It's very important we have simulation. So go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I'll, and I'll um, just touch on a couple of other fluid aspects as well. Um, Dan earlier was talking about the Reynolds number. Um, and so there's two important aspects, which is one is the Reynolds number, which is actually how turbulent, like the actual shape of the flow, is it laminar, is it in this transition, or is it fully turbulent, um, which is separate from the Mach number, which I think is what um, Dan was talking about. And that's the level of basically compression that um, the air fuel mixture goes through. Um, and I threw in into the Zoom chat, I threw in a, um, just I mapped out the, some of the dimensions for a few different flow rates to get a Reynolds number that is going to give us the right shape. Mm -hmm. um, but I also put on the Mac uh, number for, um, that applies to that as well. And you'll see um, that it goes, as you get that tolerance small, it just goes 
like almost exponentially high yeah, they um, go. Point, to the point where like and and the interpretation of that is um as you chug the flow which is something that by the way like you never want to do in a carburetor you specifically design carburetors so that they don't choke as in go mac one or above but in this system where it, it sounds like we're like purposefully designing it to choke and push energy in um, because what we're doing is pushing energy into the fluid itself um, and we're able to push enough energy in there to get this um, centrifuge out any molecules or whatever like particles that are heavy but also have a charge that's different to the the net charge does that make sense of the fluid because if you push out and if you centrifuge a charge doesn't matter if it's negative or positive um, if you push that out close to the filament that is setting up your um, toroidal dipole moment yes so um, that was kind of the way I went uh, about this investigation is like I want to purposefully induce an array of or like a whole bunch of these donut shaped um, toroidal dipole moments down the length of um, this thing and I also wanted to try and rule out well, what is the purpose of the contraflow because I still um, that part is a mystery to me that's, that's uh, the then, missing piece of the puzzle. That's the bit that's missing for you then. Yes, but yeah. The, you figured out that the, 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 the gases come down the rod and they accelerate till they hit the speed of sound, mm -hmm. which, is the, which is the Reynolds number for a fluid is the speed of sound in that fluid. The Mach number, yeah. The Mach number. So then they go round and they exponentially accelerate in a ring. They can't go forwards anymore. They go round the rod like that and they spin and go faster and faster. Right, that's, that's what your model shows. That's what Paul's work showed. That's what your model has shown. And then there's another one and another one and another one. The contra flow is the missing bit. You've got hot exhaust gas and cold fuel gas in opposite directions, mm -hmm. which creates an electrical charge. That's how yeah. lightning is, is built up. Yeah. Right? So you now you're looking at them like that on a drawing, but actually one is going like that and one is going like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the exhaust gas is spinning down the pipe one way and the fuel gas is spinning the other way. Yeah. The charge and you'll... builds up is the relative speed. Yeah. The greater the temperature differential, the greater the, pra the, the pressure and vacuum differentials, and uh, the density of the material and then the speed so if you've got something that's just traveling in a straight line you get one level of charge as soon as you make them this one is going round and it's now sitting there going faster and faster and faster and faster you're getting a higher and higher charge building up mm -hmm. yeah so eventually there's such an enormous charge that you have to get an electrical discharge you get okay. a lightning strike, which is a Townsend avalanche. It's a, a plasma cascade. Yep. You know how a, a little, like the little plasma balls work. You stick your hands on, the line of light is coming out as a Townsend avalanche. There's so many thousands of volts, or tens of thousands of volts in the middle with the ground field on the outside where you, you put your hand and your electrons that are released are going so fast that they ionize another atom and another atom and another atom. You get a cascade. Yep. So when you've got this... Like imagine vertically, you've got your first breakdown point, the first spinning ring where it's jammed up, going faster and faster. Eventually, your electrical fields get so high you start ripping apart your atoms. Once you split the atoms and you end up with two, you take one and you make it into two parts, you release that pressure, you release that vacuum, and it allows everything to move forwards up the rod until it accelerates and creates another, another vortex. And one of the other engineers years and years ago, they had a probably with a static rod, they put temperature sensors all the way along the rod. And because it's static, you get rings forming that will actually score the rod. You'll get a burn mark on the rod. And they found high points and then low points in temperature. It would get hotter and hotter and hotter and then it would crash below the temperature of the gas at this point. 
and then it will go along the rod and it will speed up and speed up and speed up and you get an increase in temperature and then there's a breakdown point and the temperature crashes below the vessel system temperature mm -hmm. and your your rod length is all about going from carbon down by half down by half down by half down by half and then you if you're short you didn't get to the last breakdown and if you're long you overrun the last breakdown point that's why mm -hmm. the, tuning the rod length to the fuel is is important but it's really tuned to carbon and then yeah. there's a bit, of, a bit of rod on the front for diesel you've got a longer rod well it's because diesel's a little bit more difficult to vaporize and you're not you're not trying to deal with micro droplets of vapor you're trying to deal with actual gas going past the rod mm -hmm. so the bubbler the delivery lines to the bottom of the reactor the bottom of the reactor itself and the tip of the rod is all about converting a liquid into a gas and then yep. it's the rod up the side where you're you're now doing work on gas converting it from gas to a an electrically conductive plasma and then rarefying that plasma and trying to break it down and you get those little vortexes stacking up one on top of the other and okay. each one will have an associated electrical field and magnetic field accordingly yeah, but yeah your model shows exactly the right chris can i come, do you want me to share that um chart uh, yeah, if you can, yeah, that'd be good. Because I, I can talk through just some of the bits and pieces. But while you're doing that, mm -hmm. um, something that Dan said kind of uh, is giving me some thought. <laughs> Dan, you're talking about um, the flow, like the ax, like around the central axis, yeah, uh, being the vorticity, where I kind of made the inlet so that it's symmetrical. Um, so that wouldn't really, it wouldn't really induce that. It would be inducing like smoke ring type uh, poloidal vorticity. Not that. Um, so I wonder if that's important because that would change with the smoke ring type poloidal, that would be a different, um, so that would be the electric TDM. That's, that would be what I'd expect. Was it would be forming a ring that is turning in on itself. It's mm -hmm. going around as well it's it's not just doing that and standing still it's it's, it's spinning yeah the fuel gas has come up they've started to spin and once they're sitting there and they're spinning they're rolling in on themselves mm -hmm. yeah. in that plane yeah no interesting okay cool um yeah bob i'll, I'll talk through the um chart really quickly if if you want okay to, because, uh yeah. give me a sec i'm just uh i that that didn't work i don't know whether it did did you see the chart when i tried to put it up then yes Oh, okay. All right. Let me, let me try that again. It's, it's gone, but I, I can get it back again. So maybe I can do it like this and do it like so this. I pulled out um, a, a Reynolds number of 8,000 just from the dimensions that uh, were posted online. I think it was from the top of my head. Can um, you see that? 25,000. It's just zoomed in a little bit. Is it possible to? Uh... What, what's zoomed in? Is it too small or is it? Yeah, you need to zoom out on that. Okay, it's not so, so trivial. So I will take take a different approach to this. Carry talking, carry on talking. I will look at look at sharing the file. Unless you want to share it, can you can you share your end? It's probably I've got lots of things on my screen. So yeah, I can share my desktop. Yeah, so if you could just share the file because you know where it is on your system. Uh, here we go. Preview. It might ask me to. Let, there we go. That's much easier. <laughs> Okay, so um, anyway, 8,000 was roughly uh, the Reynolds number that um, I gleaned out of uh, the dimensions from Pantone's patent. So that was a 25 um, thou um, of an inch tolerance. So between the restrictor and the inside diameter of the inner tube. Um, and I just assumed, based on, I don't know, just taking a pluck, that it was a, a 300 cc single engine four stroke um, cylinder. So, um, and so the parameters out of that was um, a Mach 0.3 flow. So you're still um, in incompressible regime, but um, you've got a little bit of compressibility there. Uh, and um, Reynolds number of 8,000, but, you know, if he was talking about putting this on like a tar engine, you'd easily be into supersonic. You'd be choking it um, 
and probably Reynolds number a bit higher, but I've gone with just 8,000 because, um, or 300 cc engine just because um, it's a starting point. Mm -hmm. On this graph, so the x-axis is the tolerance between, so the gap between the restrictor and the um, mm -hmm. inside diameter. Uh, and then the horizontal lines have just a real slight gradient uh, and they represent the different flow rates. So uh, the bottom one here is, sorry, second from the bottom is a 100 cc um, engine at 2000 RPM. And then it's just a linear all the way up. So it could be um, a 200 cc at 2000 RPM, or it could be a yeah, 100 cylinders, sorry, 100 cc engine running at 4000 RPM. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, the left axis is two things uh, it's your inside um, radius um, and it's in meters. So it um, takes a little bit of mental gymnastics, but um, for example, a 20 mil diameter is going to be this line here. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So this is your Mac um, line and that's indicating this is your Mac number divided by hundred as well. So you're going to have choked flow for this system at, a you know 0.35 mil uh, tolerance, um, and anything above that. So if you go to the left of that 0.35, you're going to be putting energy into um, the fluid because it is choked. So when you're trying to move a whole bunch of air down a, a pipe, mm -hmm. you get that choking. It's a compression. It's a shock wave. Yeah. And you're, you're ramming that shock, you're ramming more energy into that shock wave. Um, so that's important. And the CFD simulation breaks down probably about um, 0 0.8, 0 0.9 Mac anyway. So um, just a point to note. So the way you would um, design, I guess, is you know what your flow rate range is going to be roughly. Uh, so you would look to that area and then go across to the left, it's going to give you a um, your inside diameter. So choose um, you know, what you've got. So what did you say before? A half inch? Um, yeah, half so inch. Yeah, so... Yeah, this, you could, as, a rough, as a rough baseline, you could say that the mod is 16 mil, and right, uh, gap is mm -hmm. one mil. Okay, so 16 um, mil, um, that will be your diameter. Yeah. So I'm going to eight here. And uh, the gap we said was one mil. mil. So yeah, we're going to be over here. You're going to have a Mac number, you know, 0. 0.5 or so. Um, yeah. And your flow rate, you could you would expect would be, what's that? What, how many cc's would this be designed for? Let's put that on a 300 cc. Okay, yeah, so. Yeah, well that, that would be about the rough dimensions of a one inch reactor on like a 250, 300 cc up to a one litre engine. Um, yeah. That would be rough, rough numbers. Cool, so it checks out. Um, that you're going to be running at about you know two and a half three thousand rpm, uh, yeah. you're going to be getting uh, yeah point, point five Mac. Yeah, on, um, on, on the Hondas there are one fifty, so you've got one six seven cc there. They mm -hmm. really kick in when you get to six thousand rpm. Right. Right. Um, they're struggling. Below 3,000 RPM, they're really struggling. There's not enough airspeed through the reactor to get a really nice, stable performance. That's why getting them to run as a generator can be quite challenging because your generating speed is actually lower than the reactor's real happy operating speed. And yeah, you sure. Put that up to about 4,000 RPM and suddenly it all settles down and stabilizes. And about 6,000 RPM, you stand there and you'd think the thing's just idling. You'd think it's doing two or three. 
by the way it sounds, you wouldn't really don't realize it's going in six thousand. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's from there up that that reaction really gets stable, which is that's kind of what we've got on here. You, you're over in those higher ranges with that little engine. Your, your gaps that your model are, are way too small for a geek reactor. You want to put, just do your modeling in a one a one mil gap. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, point, nice. Point eight is the smallest gap that you can get petrol to go through and react. Anything smaller than that, it won't, it won't react. Um, yep. Anything above 1.2, and it won't react now. Okay. But there is that, that's the window operation with, with like petrol. It's got to yep. be within that range. So mm -hmm. it's like, have I got a big enough reactor for my engine? If I want more fuel, I need a bigger gap to get more fuel past the rod. But if I exceed 1.2 millimeters, it will shut down. Okay. So, so that, what I would have to be modeling to get really close to what a real world reactor would actually be. Nice. Yeah. So, what I would like to be able to do is to, we've got two parameters, the Mach number and the Reynolds number to vary. Um, and this, this set of parameters is only valid for trying to target Reynolds number of 8,000. So, it sounds like that target is a little bit off. Um, and like if, if we are choking the flow, if that's occurring, then um, we need to change the Reynolds number to get that choked flow occurring around this one mil, um, you know, point eight to one mil. Yeah, is what you're telling me. So yeah, um, it's, that's it's great. In, in a practical sense, it needs a higher engine speed than yeah. a normal generator is outputting, which is yeah, that's why, that's why they really work nicely when you can go a bit faster. Um, it's worth gearing your engines down or gearing the, the generator down. I actually built a test bench for this. It's been a whole year working on it. We've got a two and a half gram state of the art torque transducer that it's, it's data capture is so fast. It can see the changes in tension and loading between the compression stroke and the intake stroke. And the, you can actually see your torque go up and down per, per revolution of the engine. Yeah, it's got a custom built flywheel, big one, uh, variable pitch pulley with an eight kilowatt generator. So I can run from, I think it will do 500 RPM and you can get the generator running at its minimum speed to put power out and do a load test. Mm -hmm. And then it will go all the way up to 15,000 RPM and keep the generator below 3000. So yep. we had a load bank that would allow us to have the engine at a speed and then test the torque output and emissions and everything else by changing a knob on the on the variable pulley. I just yep. I had to I deliver, I built built the damn thing. We had it all engineered and made. It got delivered to another part of our team for testing, and that was two years ago, and I haven't seen it since. Yeah, so right. I'll, one, I'll have to have another one built. <laughs> yeah. that, I lost that, <laughs> but I, at least I know what the design specs were, and I've got guys in India who will go, "Yes, Dan, no problems. We're making one of these. You'll have it for four days, and it will cost you five hundred quid." Yeah, uh, nice. <laughs> nice. Did, <laughs> Here's the address, so we'll get another one. Did um, they ever hook it up to? Uh, is it like a PVT um, graph? I know. I just remember from messing around with engines, you would be able to draw this. Um, curve out on like a volume um, temperature uh, pressure graph and the area that it would put out would be the the work essentially um did any have you ever seen any of those graphed out running on gate because that would be interesting to look at not off the top of my head no no, no. yeah um i know like universities have have this um set up and maybe some top end um garages so it might be interesting to get our hands on one um for mfmp that's, that's sorry much i missed that chris what, what were we talking about i'll have to look up exactly what it's called but it, it's a scope that will measure the pressure um your temperature and uh i think there's one other parameter maybe it's just pressure and temperature uh and volume displacement as the auto cycle goes through oh, okay uh, and it, it and might be that Alan already has that in his lab because he's he's the uh, head of the Norton Motorbike Society of America and he has lots yeah, of I'm, engines. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. A geek system will really confuse that 
because it doesn't breathe through a normal intake size. Those yeah. Muscles, they, they've got a 16 mil intake. But when I've got a reactor set on there, I put on my, on like the valve, on my air management valve, I use a little three-eighths valve, and then I put a, a brass insert in the end with a very small hole. Mm -hmm. So I'm yeah. not breathing. I've got this thing breathing through like a three millimeter inlet to the reactor and like four or five millimeters to the engine. Mm. And that's all it's breathing through. It's running at 11, 12, 13, 14 inches of mercury. It isn't getting the volume of air in there that it would normally be seeing in any way, but it still runs at full load. Mm. They'll still rev. I mean, the, the, I was in a, a Yoke, uh, Yoke's workshop in Holland. He was a professional vehicle restoration expert and he'd sold those engines for years. And he said, they're, they're shit. They never produce what they're supposed to produce and they clatter and they're noisy. And he walked in one day and this thing was running away through these tiny little holes. And all you can hear is this hissing noise. It's this sucking air through this tiny little, precisely machined little venturi to get the air in there. Mm -hmm. without costing the vacuum but yeah there's no way is there anywhere near the original volume of, of gas moving <laughs> through those things there's not 125 cc of air going in there per intake no well uh, there's gotta uh, be <laughs> there's gotta <laughs> be <laughs> otherwise you're breaking mass continuity um which no, yeah. well why not <laughs> 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 something i'll go away and think on <laughs> it's sucking to say it's it's sucking air through some tiny tiny little holes <laughs> there's, there's no yeah. way it's actually managing to if it was managing to fill the piston completely the inlet manifolds vacuum would have to go all the way to zero to have equalized the piston but it's not it's pulled that it's pulled the charge of air in against 11 inches of mercury so like as the as the piston comes round. Yeah. They're 10 degrees past top dead centers when they open their inlet valve. I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but that's yeah. that's at 11 inches of mercury. So mm -hmm. it's sucking the piston backwards. It's got to go all the way around to the bottom and then try to close. And it's pulled yeah. in depressurized air. And it hasn't yeah. all got a chance to come in. It's <laughs> trying to suck itself backwards. Yep. 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 Okay. <coughs> yeah. So that's why it would be interesting, is because you'd start. Like your maximum would be 11 inches, but it might only fill up until, you know, six inches or something like that. Or I don't, I have no idea, but I see what you're saying. Like by the time it's fully um, at the bottom. Yeah. Yeah. You, you've let a little bit in, but not. You, you've got to evolve the same amount of bit. vacuum in the cylinder as you have in the intake manifold to get sure. air to go forwards. Yeah. Yeah. It's all under vacuum. It's very, this is why it gets complicated because you think it's so simple. It just looks like a bunch of blind pipe hanging on the side of an engine. Then you realize you've got to get gases to move in and out of that engine in the so right direction. Running, and they actually want to go backwards. So when you're running like in that dual mode or the crossover mode, um, is that you would have a separate carburetor or, or are you still having that kind of vacuum condition with the normal fuel, like vaporized fuel coming through the carburetor as well. Yeah, yeah, they work quite well. I mean, I've, I've, when I was playing with the HX stove stuff last year, I took my carburetor from my heat reactor, made a new air management valve, put the carburetor on the end with a side inlet, put my HHO line there and bolted the thing onto the engine. And those engines run perfectly well. It's a, it's a model aircraft carburetor from a 0.6 cc model aircraft. Okay. Yeah. It's got a four mil throat with a little bobbin that turns and lifts mm -hmm. up down slightly, which is a little bit inconvenient because it messes with the fuel delivery as you turn the thing. Yeah. So you don't get a lot of play. Um, but those engines will run at 11 inches of vacuum with no geek system involved at all, just sucking through the little carburetor and giving yeah. a little bit of air on the side. They'll actually run quite nicely like that. Yeah. So what I've found... Um through my stuff is that it is <laughs> I, I wanted to do just um remove as much stuff as i could so uh i thought maybe i could just use a compressor to blow air through and 
what I've found is you just can't get the kind of displacement and the vacuum out of anything that's really accessible. It's just just go to a big engine. I think is the, the easiest way. So that's what I'm. Actually, on. Chris, can can uh, David may, has been trying to do just that. Uh, David Butilia, are you are you there? Can you share your experience? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I actually used a rotary vane vacuum pump um, with a quarter inch uh, glass rod, um, and I was trying to get you know just a totally glass um, inner tube and glass rod to see if I could actually take a picture of the plasma right i want to see what's happening in there but i was unable to get uh anything to light up but my setup was extremely crude but um i did use a rotary vane vacuum pump and i measured i was running around 15 inches of mercury vacuum on the vacuum side of it on yeah on the exhaust um dave how much uh what kind of cfm or what kind of flow rate on the exhaust side of the I, vacuum well see i was using a just a rotary vane vacuum pump, the same one I use for the Vega experiments. So I don't know what the actual flow rate, rate would have been. Um, I had a bubbler upstream with some toluene vapor and water in it. Um, and I basically throttled that is my throttle point, the inlet valve to that. So the bubbler mm -hmm. would be under vacuum as well. And I could vary the amount of vacuum. And I was just measuring the vacuum at the rotary vane pump itself. Cool. One easy way just to ha like have a look at just even put a balloon or something over the exhaust side of the the rotary vein. And I, can... I might be able to. Um, it doesn't have a very easy discharge. Um, the discharge is usually oil vapor and it's kind of nasty. Um, right. Yeah, I would have to have probably something on the inlet side. I could put a uh, flow meter, like one of those oxygen flow meter type ball, floating ball things. I do have one of them somewhere so I might be able to try, but yeah, I was yeah. unable to see any plasma there and I can't really vary the amount of volume throughput through the pump. It's kind of yeah. fixed, right? Yeah. So I think, yeah, like what you said too, though, is another thing is the engine provides pulsations. You know, it's not a constant vacuum. You've got pulsations of very high vacuum and then it lets off. So we've, we're going through a wide range of vacuum conditions right at, around the rod and at the base of the rod if it's on an engine. You don't really get that with a rotary vane vacuum pump. I can change the vacuum, but it's not constantly dynamic like that. Yeah, yeah you don't want the dynamic shifts. There you don't the, want the dynamic shifts? No, you want the constant stable vacuum. Okay, so the pump but would that's, probably that's be the better then, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that is the challenge with the little single cylinder engine is it's suck blow. Oh, okay, so you yeah. want an accumulator, yeah. a vacuum tank in between almost. Exactly. That's yeah. why we have that piece of gas line. That, uh, yes. Yeah. That so what gas might... line is allowing you to, to get a stable vacuum. Oh, I see. What might be appropriate is um, aircon uh, pumps or vacuum pumps. Uh, in fact, I think they're compression pumps, but they're um, continuously variable in terms of displacement. Mm -hmm. um, and that might be, I don't know what kind of flow rate I'll put out, but that might be the way to go if we can miniaturize the, the system like Dave and I, it sounds like we're both kind of looking at, we've got the um, quarter inch glass tube with the inner. Um, we can actually just heat the tube as well. So I just got nichrome wire on the tube with um, two stainless steel um, hose clamps. Uh, and then I, we could also just put in, we could also just charge it to- Are you, burn, are you burning the fuel as it comes off this thing? No, I, I wasn't. No, got to burn I wasn't. Fuel. Got to burn that fuel and send it backwards down the reactor as the exhaust. Yeah, because I've seen some I... systems where they just use on the intake. They do not recycle the exhaust. Some of uh, Paul's work, I believe, had systems like that as well, right? Oh no, the reactor has to have the contra flow of gases. You've got to have fuel vapor going. Oh yes. The and then it well, what I was I wasn't yeah. using fuel vapors, but what I was using is a heat gun. So I was actually running a heat gun counter flow down through the odor tube, right? And the glass tube was in the center with the glass rod in the middle of that. And so it was counter flow. It was op opposite direction, but it wasn't burnt exhaust. It was just hot air from a heat gun. It, yeah. it needs to be the burnt exhaust. If you, if you don't have the air fuel mix right on the heat reactor, on the air management valve, the reactor shuts down. If you isolate the engine from the reactor, the reactor shuts down. You have to burn its fuel 
and then that fuel gas has to travel backwards through the reactor on the exhaust side. Otherwise, you won't get a reaction. And so the of that is like it completes uh, an electrical type circuit. There's a yeah. the whole looping electrical circuit going on. Dan, Josh is uh, asking. Josh Hennan has just joined the chat here on Zoom. He's saying, "Is that because it's producing ions, and the ions are then setting up the electrical differential?" Probably. Probably. Okay. I mean, we we know that if you dis if you disengage it from its combustion chamber. It shuts down, and there is a there is actually a version of GEEP that is a furnace burner that we might put out in the next set of stuff. That's exactly what you're doing, using a pump to suck on a bubbler and suck it through the reactor, and then send it to a burner, and then take the exhaust gas from the burner and go back through the system. There is actually a furnace burner design of GEEP that does exactly that, using a rotary vane pump. Um, if you want to build a glass reactor then you first build a steel one on an engine you get that working and you get everything spot on so you get all the rest of the equipment correct so that you've got a working reactor and then you can unscrew your reactor take out the two pieces of steel pipe and put in two glass ones hang it back onto the engine with all of your equipment and now you can have a glass key reactor where you can see what's happening inside and you can induce all the fields and things I've may, done. May, I, may I offer another suggestion uh, inspired by something that Felix has just said on, on YouTube? Perhaps, and, and this is something that I speaks to uh, David's uh, capability, um, perhaps you could wrap a, an RF coil and ionize the gas coming out. So uh, it is ions traveling back down the tube the other way. You could, you could try that, that might be a way without actually combusting it. Uh, David, what do you think about that? Um, in order to ionize it with RF, you would need to have like a microwave oven kind of level of yeah. power. Yeah. Um, it, it may be easier just to have another, you know, a flame come back somehow. I agree. Um, probably the easiest way is to put it on an engine. Like, <laughs> you know, that, that's definitely where I want to go with this. So um, it was just materials that I had on hand at the time that was extremely quick for me to, uh, to put together. Um, I haven't hauled the engine out yet to try and uh, retrofit it. I have ordered the parts, proper steel components to do this in a much, you know, a bigger fashion and a lot better quality. Um, I just thought as a first attempt, it would be very nice to be able to image some of this plasma. There's definitely, there's definitely some things you could do. I mean, you could put, you could put water in there um, with uh, quinine or tonic water. Okay. Yeah. Through the system, shine a UV light on it, and it will glow. So if you image that in the dark with a with a decent camera, um, you should be able to see the way that vapors and things move upwards past a rod inside a glass tube when they're going at those kind of speeds. The way that it actually moves through the reactor, you might be able to see that. With, hmm. with yeah, that's a good the point. Okay. There, may, there, may, there may be other learning curves involved there. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I apologize for joining in late here. So this might have already been covered. But yeah, my, my drive was to try and image the plasma and get, you know, some modern um, pictures or video of that um, in whichever way possible, right? And I don't know if you've covered this already. But um, yeah, if there's any information that's still around of the glass versions that people have made in the past, or that Paul had talked about, um, yeah. that would be fantastic yeah, to get our hands on. The tip that Paul always says is build it in steel, get it to work, get it all tuned in, get all your exhaust delivery set, get your back pressures right, get all the rest of it right, get something working really well that you're sure is working properly. And then without touching anything else, just take the reactor apart, switch out those two steel rods, two, two steel pipes with glass ones. And I think he used uh, Millie Putt to bond them in. Poxy Putty, Millie Putt. You'll find that it's a high temperature very hard material, very easy to work with, works well in geek reactors and you can you can bed all your pipes in, let it cure for a few hours, clean it up, and then you've got nice airtight seals and you can you can run a reactor with glass pipes. And he said it lights up with all kinds of crazy electrical discharges. It's not really running correctly, but it will do some impressive light shows. Yeah, that's that's kind of what I think in order to understand more about the physics that's happening and the dynamics. I think that's critical to have that image somehow, right? Thank yeah. you.
it would be worth I don't know how to do this really practically it would be worth having like a sputtering machine and putting a conductive coating inside and outside of the tubes something you can still see through um, because the metal tube it has a, a positive side and a negative side and then there's the gas and there's the next bit so there's, there's an electrical movement you'd almost want to coat the glass with something to give it a conductivity and then bridge from one side to the other so it kind of behaves more like a piece of steel would electrically rather than a piece of glass then you're going to get a, a truer representation of what's happening inside the reactor than if it's just bare glass but i don't know i would never got as far as playing with it myself but that was where my head was at when i was thinking about glass reactors it's like it's not going to just allow a free movement of, of electrons and charge carriers and things it's going to behave differently and did you say before that someone took measurements of the voltages of those different points i seem to remember they someone's done that yeah yeah because paul kind of paul's drawings has the polarity of it which will flip in the southern hemisphere so it would be well, i can't remember which round it is i have to find the book these like positive on the outside of the case then the inside wall of the case will be negative and then the outer layer of your fuel pipe will be positive and then the inside is negative and then the blob is, is the next one and then you go to the southern hemisphere and it will invert um any idea what the like order of magnitude of the voltages were was it like tens or hundreds or probably probably tens of volts because you're measuring the inner and outer voltages on mm -hmm. a piece of steel i don't think there'll be high voltages there you can find, I've seen voltages up to a few hundred volts if I've measured between uh, the top fuel pipe as it comes out of the reactor and then down on the reactor case and you can probe around and you, sometimes you can find hot spots and high, high value electrical different differentials between one part and another. Yeah, that's, that's kind of next on my to-do list is just to add a bias to the inner tube um, in, this is not having a uh, contra flow, so um, uh, keep cracking away at it. So yeah. Josh uh, Hennan is asking, has the um, alignment to the North Pole uh, for a 30 minute um, uh, orientation, that, that whole aspect when you start it up? I know we've discussed it, Dan, but Josh, do you want to ask your question yourself? You're there. Okay, he's he's just listening in. So he says in the chat, has the need to run the rod in uh, rod in for thirty minutes aligned north south in the correct orientation being discussed? So I know you've got some points to make on that, Dan. Okay, <clears throat> when you've got a new reactor and it's the horizontal reactors or a <clears throat> slight slant, um, you're trying to overcome the magnetic fields of the metal and establish a new one. So it's Earth's magnetic field plus the reactor's field. So when you have it set up so that the top of the reactor where the exhaust comes in is facing to the north, uh, the Earth's magnetic field is working with you. So it can make it easier to get the reactors to start up the first time round and start to, to imprint their fields. If you're facing south, then Earth's magnetic field is working against you. Now, it still might start up and kick in and do its thing. It depends on how strongly magnetized all the metal was and which way around you happen to put all the pipes. So it was just a rule of thumb. If you had a horizontal reactor when it was new, the first few times that you run it, you do it facing north because on odd occasions, you may suddenly discover that it won't kick in if you're facing another direction. The vertical reactors don't have that issue. They're, they are not directional. They okay, just run, run however. Thank you. Uh, Gerald, Gerald WP for Truth. I think you've actually made a geet. Uh, are you able to talk to your experience? And have you got any questions, Dan? Are you there? Hello, hello. Testing. Hi, Giles. Testing. Go ahead. Yeah, at the moment, I'm still in the point of uh, construction, so I have nothing to add, unfortunately, but I will in the future. Do you have any questions you wanted answered that haven't been asked yet? You know what? It's been such an amazing group and the questions that uh, have already been asked have covered pretty much every point that I would ask. So 
Thank well, you. I, I have to second that. I, can everyone give a big round of applause to Dan? This is a fantastic. Oh, <laughs> he's he's been going for for he's he's he's, uh, he's been going what was it three and a bit hours I think so far. <laughs> three three hours eighteen minutes and he's been on the spot. That that's that's absolutely awesome. I want to say that we've got people from all over the world, nearly every major time zone right now. I mean, the project has about 54 countries that tune in from time to time. But um, uh, yeah, we've, we've got people from Japan all the way through to Brazil. So Alex de Castillo, you've got your hand up. Could, do you want to ask a question? And firstly, thank you, Dan. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs> Quick question. Have you been able to run under load for a long time with no fuel added or you know no petrol gasoline added and just like on vinegar or seawater or whatever or, or or like sugar water or it does there have to be like some kind of hydrocarbon in there you need a hydrocarbon well you need something flammable to start the engine right i got that get to get something in there to get it start and then they will run on very, very, very little, but they do like to have a little bit of a hydrocarbon in, in the mix to, to keep it going. But that's normally because I've got a rod length that's a big long rod for doing fun fuel tests. What was a called as, as fun fuel? So 20% out, 20% petrol and then 80% not petrol. Uh, there is a length of rod for water, which is a very little, yeah. little rod. Um, if you put one of those in there and you build a reactor based on the little tiny short rods, then you will probably only need a bit of petrol to start it, and after that, it should carry on. Um, that's that's not easy. That's not easy work. <laughs> You've got to really, really, really know how to tune the whole damn thing to perfection before you can take a bigger reactor off and put a little one in there with a little rod and then rebalance it. You need a little bit of something. Do you know of any of these that are like running a house for a long time, like you know, weeks or months, and they just keep adding cooking oil and water or whatever? Is, is, there, is it, have we got got to that point yet? There were there were a few dealerships, and there were a few people who did classes with Paul that had bigger systems that were just running continuously feeding their house. Uh, the challenge has always been throttle control. It's having Paul always built mechanical throttle systems. And invariably, he throttled on the carburetor. But if your mix is wrong between your air management valve and the carburetor, your reactor goes between the two modes of operation. So you throttle the thing down under with no load. It ceases to be a geek reactor, becomes a vaporizing carburetor, and it sits there trundling away, making some pollution. And then yeah. put it under load, the governor arm swings open, everything comes up to, your, to the settings you've got, and then you've got a geek reactor running away quite nicely for however long you want to load. But it had dynamic load control is the next major thing. That was kind of my plan for this year was to not go near an engine until I'd sat down and put the control system together. Because Arduino have now got a drag and drop programming tool where you could just lay out the workflow of your software and then connect it all together. Suddenly that means I can, I can code now if I can use that. So I was going to sit here yeah. this year and just go through 50 quid on Arduino, buy some bits and start putting together the code that allows it to do a diagnostic sweep and go through the various fuel settings, figure out what's maybe wrong. And I want a, two knobs and a button. So I can go air fuel at the bottom, air fuel at the top, find a setting, put it under load. Well, that's 500 watts. Press button, log. And then you go through your settings, you tune it in to each each range, you hit your log button and then it's it's set. Then you can put the generator on in the yard, it can idle, it will close all its valves, it will maintain a key reaction, run nice and clean, which will A, make it clean, but also allow you to run on other random things because it's just stalled if the reactor cuts down. And you know, if you're running on lots and lots of water and sugar and urine and things with a little bit of flammables in there and the reactor shuts down, the engine will stall. So it'll keep it in balance. And then it will rev up and down under load. And what we're planning is to make a carburetor unit with the control and an air management valve unit with its controls and the software. 
Um, the mounting plates that we, we bolt everything onto an engine are an aluminium plate. They're a 15 mil aluminium block. So if you want to buy the drill bit big enough to put through there and then buy a tap and die to stick through there, we're well, looking at 70, 80 bucks and you've got one size on the intake and one size on the exhaust. So it's a really expensive bit of tooling to just to make two aluminium slugs. So we're thinking, what if we have those made and we have a nice air management valve with a control and a nice carburetor unit with the controls and a box. Then everyone buys that and then they go out and they build their heat reactor and they hang it on their engine and they go through all the other learning curves of building different exempt exhaust pipes and things, tuning their system to their engine. But yeah, fuel delivery yeah. is taken care of and air management valves are taken care of. That gets you your vacuum and a clean fuel delivery with a throttle. Dan, I think that's a fantastic idea, really. And, and I, I know the community would be willing to help you in any way possible to make that a realisation. And I think, actually, uh, before we uh, uh, hand the mic to Aletta and Douglas, uh, can I just ask you to tell you where, where people can currently contact you, your, your domain name, uh, uh, where, where you intend to publish this information we're discussing that you're going to publish over the next coming weeks? It's, it's going to go out through Geek International's website. Okay. David's, over, David's overhauling the website at the moment. He's mm -hmm. been working mm -hmm. on it for some time, but he's getting there. It's getting apparently it's looking quite good. I haven't had time to even look at it yet. Okay, great. Can I also <laughs> say extend in this recording, which is public on YouTube, thank you to David uh for you know being happy with you talking to us and also uh for the information that he's agreed to for you to share with us when when we shut down the youtube stream in, in in a short while but before we go there um yeah so can we just have a big clap to david pantone for, yes for, uh, okay. uh, david carrying the torch all these years yeah yeah so big hand to that and and then uh can i ask aletta and douglas to uh, uh i don't know which one of you are. i i don't <laughs> i could probably guess but i don't want to presume <laughs> do you want to fire away you need to unmute <clears throat> Thank there we you. Go. yeah just a quick follow-up i think i heard earlier dan you said <clears throat> uh you would be releasing some information about the um the home energy unit which there are a few pages in the Book of Geet that show this very intriguing home energy unit, uh, obviously uh, driven by a, an air pump or a vacuum pump. And um, it's, you know, I, I won't go into all the questions I have about it, but one thing that struck me about it was in order to distribute gas to, you know, from the generator unit, which might be remote from the stove and from other gas powered devices in your house, you have to have some pressure behind the geek gas to make it flow through the pipes to the various appliances. Yeah. So it, it strikes me that you would need to have very good, reliable pressure control on your household distribution of geek gas. Yeah. It, I, it, were, was that problem solved or is that, is that a, a, a genuine concern? Um, I don't think anybody's been really been trying to do it, so no one's hit the hit the problem yet. Um, you but you would need a very reliable pressure sensing system that could say switch off the delivery now. You, you, you've turned off your boiler, you've shut down your gas cooker. You're not using any gas, and it mustn't be sending any gas to that line. It's got to stop. It's got to shut down. It can't be allowed to pressurize. Otherwise, it will it will the, the pump will act like an engine. It will just go off in the pump, um, especially if you've got a little piston air compressor type pump. Mm. They don't evolve a huge amount of pressure, but they will evolve enough. If they're hooked up to a, a tank, they will generate enough pressure for the geek gas to ignite in the pump. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, if you were if you were trying to run a, a system on it, um, best not to shut the valves off on your burner and then walk away and just leave the thing running. It will, <laughs> it's good. You know, there's, um, there's a difference between technology that's ready for general purpose use and technology that engineers that have built their device can get away with. <laughs> there's just one more question that I wanted to ask that comes up in that connection. So from the diagrams in the, in, uh, the book of Geet, uh, you see the surprising arrangement of the reactor tube. It's 
upside down from the normal orientation of a vertical reactor. Um, in other words, the hot end is down because the, the geek gas burner is below the vertical reactor tube. So that's yep. upside down yep. with, re with respect to the normal way you build it for a vertical reactor. Um, I just want, and, and I also, I, I've seen a couple of um, videos on the internet where people were working with a car and they'd actually oriented the, their heat reactor upside down. Yep. I, I just wondered um, what are the implications of running it that way? And does that make it diff more difficult to position the rod so that it rises into the correct reaction zone? Um, no, no, it, all, it works just as well upside down. You wouldn't think it, it actually works perfectly well upside down. The only difference is normally your, the T at the bottom for your fuel side where you put the rod in, well, the rod was tipped down and it has a little holder that catches the tip. So now it's uh, upside down, it's ass end down, but you still open the reactor from the bottom and slide the rod in with a holding wire. Mm. Ups, but it's upside down and it picks itself up in the magnetic field. Mm. It's just sitting at the other end of the reactor now, so it's immediately blown down. But as it's being blown, it actually travels against mm. the flow and lifts itself up in the mm. reactor and spins on its magnetic magnetic bearing. So there must be some feedback effects where if the rod is rising, going too far in the cold direction, it gets pushed back into yeah. the right zone. If it's going too far in the other direction, there must be some dynamic feedback that keeps yeah. the position. Yeah. Thank you. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, and sorry, what was your name, <laughs> by the way? Oh, my, my I'm Douglas. <laughs> OK. My last name is Zorc. I'm glad we cleared that up. My last name is Zork, Z-O-R-K. Oh, that's a freaking cool second name. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to change my name right now. To Zork. <laughs> okay, so uh, I've got a question here on uh, the Remote View blog. It's um, He's saying, could it be that by passing the carburetor jets, water molecules are able to enter the intake manifold past the GEAT reactor and contribute to extra power generation by simply expanding into steam due to high temperatures plus 200 degrees and the combustion of the gasoline vapors. Is, is it a steam engine? <laughs> <laughs> you can, you can get water past the heat reactor. Mm -hmm. It will go past it. Um, mm -hmm. you, the reactor will shut down when that happens. Okay. It doesn't, it doesn't like that. Any droplets of any liquid that hit the rod stop it from spinning. Right, okay. Um, you, basically, you, you have to watch the emissions. Mm -hmm. I don't have a sense of smell. Like I, I don't know if things are on fire in my workshop, let alone yeah. what's coming out of the end out of the engine. Um, some, but then one of the guys who does have a very good sense of smell stood there with the gas analyzer and told me what it smells like with different readings. Mm -hmm. um, so you start off with it smells of diesel, then it smells of petrol, then it starts smelling of ethanol, methane, butane, like a gas engine, and suddenly it smells of something you can't identify, and then it doesn't smell of anything. There's nothing mm -hmm. there at all. Um, the point at which you don't know what it is, is about 10 part per million unburned fuel, 10, 20, 20 parts per million. When you can't smell anything at all, it's just warm air. Uh, it's down to no carbon dioxide, no carbon monoxide, 18, 20% oxygen and no unburned fuel. It's interesting. I've got Alex de Costello yeah. saying water injection was used in World War II fighters for a power boost. And they injected it, I guess, directly into the combustion chamber. It did, yes, it sprayed it straight in. Mm -hmm. um, but if you hit the the after if you hit the boost as a World War II pilot and then it's a bit flat, you got a bollocking when you got home because you blew the engine. It got you out of it, it get you get you got home, the plane got home, but you've wrecked the engine and it needs to be stripped and rebuilt because it, it acts as a steam cleaner and it washes the oil off the inside of the piston housing <laughs> and then you eat the piston rings out very quickly and if you try to run an engine with anything more than about 40 percent water you will very quickly eat out all piston rings that's a good point there so um has anyone else got any questions in the chat here before i shut the youtube stream down and thank you for everyone who joined us on youtube you still can get into the um zoom uh go to remote view for the link there uh but if not i'd say uh i'd like 
there's a lot of people said thank you and there's a lot of people that made comments here that they really appreciate what people have done and and, and the discussion here even some people are saying that well, i'm not technical but i'm really enjoying listening to this uh which <laughs> which is an achievement in its own right <laughs> fantastic so so really that's that's been great so i'm gonna kill so i'd like to say if you say goodbye to the people on uh, yes. youtube goodbye everyone on youtube uh, and, and can you, Dan, just say where in a couple of weeks they can expect to get um, the information that we're going to be talking technically in a few minutes? Uh, uh, where yeah, where can be, they find that and they when? Will go to Geet International, Geet International's website. Um, All right. So there um, it is, Geet International's website. In a couple of weeks, I'm going to say goodbye to YouTube now. Bye, YouTube people. <laughs>